So good afternoon to all the participants and today's speaker. Uh, the memorial lecture three, we had a traditional three memorial lectures of IICG. So it is generally start with the HL Roy memorial lecture, but due to the time uh, matching with the US speakers, we'll be first conducting the NR Kamath memorial lectures for 2020. So before going to start officially, I'd like to read out the citation of Ekar Power Gas Professor N.R. Kamath and Mrs. Rosina Kamath Memorial Lectures. Late Professor N.R. Kamath, in whose memory the Indian Institute of Chemical Engineers organized a lecture in its annual session was a most distinguished and devoted figure in the profession of chemical engineering. A member of the institute since 1949 till his demise on the 9th July 1983, he was the president during 1974 and 1975. He was also a fellow of the Institute Chemical Engineers, London. Born on 8 September 1914, he obtained his BSc Honours degree from Bombay University in 1934 with unique distinctions of securing 100% marks in chemistry and then BSc technology in chemical engineering with first class distinction from the same university. Late Professor Kamath completed postgraduate diploma in chemical engineering from the University College London, commenced his doctoral research work on drying of pigments. Under Professor H. E. Waxton, which could, be, could not be completed owing to the outbreak of the Second World War. He joined London Select Research Bureau and was associated with it from 1940 to 1946. He developed a coating wholly based on Select and also a waterproofing material based on Select he brought out 18 publications relating to utilization of lac. Professor Kamath joined Department of Chemical Technology, University of Bombay in 1946 as Sir Homi Mehta reader in the technology of plastics, paints and varnish. He variably organized teachings and research activities in the department of polymer and was instrumental in the founding of the color society. He became professor of polymer technology in 1958. Soon thereafter, he joined the newly founded IIT Bombay as professor and head of the department of chemical technology and become its deputy director in 1969. He was felicitated for his contribution to education and research in plastics on the occasion of All India Plastics Manufacturing Association in 1978. He served on several committees of the government. He retired from IIT in 1974. Let he continue his link with industry in the capacity of advisor in the field of plastics, paints, painting, ink, and other chemicals. Professor Kamath was an eminent scholar, teacher, and a researcher. For his valuable contribution of vast knowledge and research to several fields, particularly silk, paints, plastics, and polymers, he was held in high esteem by the industrialists and other people in the profession. He earned the Ad admiration of the members of the institute for his earnest effort towards its development. From the year 2008, 
the lecture is called akar power gas professor nr kamath and mrs ruzena kamath memorial lecture which has expertise in engineering and construction of process plants of petrochemicals fine chemicals polymers oil gas refining hydrocarbon and metal and has important client in so i feel very happy to read out the citation of professor nr kamath and the our memorial lectures will be delivered by very respectable persons from thermax dr r r sonde vice president of thermax so now i am requesting dr sonde sir to start your presentation thank you avijit uh, good afternoon to all of you i hope i am audible enough avijit to all the people is my audio okay uh, avijit uh, yes it is absolutely okay sir thank you so much so with all my humility at my command uh, i kind of uh, start this uh, memorial lecture in the name of such a great person uh, so only one thing that can i express is the humility because these are the people who led the entire kind of a pathway for chemical engineering to flourish in this uh, country so i am eternally indebted to uh, professor kamat and people like that who actually showed us the way uh, without taking further time uh, good afternoon to everybody and uh, season's greetings uh, thank you very much for choosing me uh, to deliver this memorial uh, talk uh let me start uh, sharing my 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 presentation i think i will go on till about 35 40 minutes leaving certain uh, certain time for question and answer so if that's okay i would i'm just want to share my my screen right now so uh, let me do that so is it visible now yes sir it is visible okay all right so the topic that i have chosen is a technology leadership and the need for building a r&d driven ecosystem in india because uh, i know that uh, we have got a certain kind of a r&d within academia research and uh, industry but somehow they are not gelling well or it is not delivering the desired results for the kind of intellect that this country is uh, boasting of and therefore i thought let me bring out what are the strengths and weaknesses of our ecosystem and what is it what is it required to actually strengthen our r&d system and as it is shown here in this particular picture it shows that my own kind of a conclusion is that in india if you want to really become a cutting edge technology developer disruption in new technology which is happening all over the globe in the developed world only way is the best of the people should come together and collaboration is the only way forward as you can see uh, you know i was involved in this development of a high temperature pem cell you can see on the left side where we working with five csi laboratories uh, ncl karaikudi and and npl and 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 then of course working with iit delhi and iit gandhinagar incidentally i have now shifted from thermax and i become a visiting full time professor at iit delhi we developed this one of the state of the art using a polybenzo imidazole membrane based uh, high temperature pem cell involving the global partner like bsf indian partners tier 1 tier 2 companies where i'm convinced and there's going to be some part of my later on talking about the hydrogen as a future economy and pathway for energy transition and the fuel cell is one of the key cog in this particular wheel of hydrogen and we developed it a high technology using this collaboration between research institution academic institution smes uh, the global partners and i took that leadership for running this program and we delivered this and uh, dedicated to the nation you can also see we developed this particular during the during this particular covid time what we call non invasive ventilator you can see the solar plant we developed when i was with atomic energy where i spent my my uh, initial formative years of 21 years in deep r and d we developed this technologies for the country but we did it in a active collaboration with indian industry and research institution and 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 many other institutions so my only one message that i'm giving from this particular first slide is that the only way that we should bring this uh, ecosystem is by collaboration now 
Indian uh, journey, if you talk, I'm not going to take too much time on this science and technology and post-independence, has been impressive. I mean, we can quote numbers that from a meagerly 4,500 gigawatt hours, we have built 100 and, uh, 100, uh, 1,200 terawatt hours and uh, hoping uh, 300 times rise in all the kind of a thing, whether you take the petrochemicals, whether you take the fertilizers, whether you take cement, whether you take steel, there has been a phenomenal growth, but but the big but here is that we are still 129th in the list of human development index. So if you are developing, we are the sixth largest economy, but still our human development index is not very impressive. It's because, and I feel that that could be one of the reason that we are not actively solving. We means the so-called intellectuals, the, the academia, the research institutions. We are not actually focused in solving societal problems. In fact, uh, this is a kind of a constant debate I have got with a lot of uh, academicians and, and research fellows that uh, we are not kind of looking at what are the real uh, problems, life problem that 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 is uh, there in the society, whether it's the health or energy or food or nutrition or agriculture or whatever that you talk about it, and somehow we are not aligning ourselves, and therefore probably we are we are we are having this kind of a deficit in terms of building whatever science and technology because we realize that human development index is a direct function of the strength of the science and its relation to the to the prosperity of the nation if you are not the kind of aligning your science to the prosperity of the nation then we have got a challenge and always i use this particular stokes uh, four quadrant uh, picture because that's a very favorite of mine and i always say this when you want where where the fundamental research has to get into the use of inspired research, which is the quadrant three, where pasture quadrant is one of the one of the holy grail for all of us, where our R and D, our research, will always be able to meet the societal needs or the use of that particular research to directly solving the problems and elevating the lifestyle or 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 the human development, whether it is the health or, as I said, in all 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 all, all aspects which actually form the part of the human development matrix. Everything can be sorted out by solved by by doing a deep research. And when we talk about uh, Louis Pasteur or Edward Jenner, who gave their life, I mean, they were ready to kind of. Uh, I'm I'm saying in a in a philosophical way, they were ready to kind of uh, put their life on the anvil to solve the problem. Because when you talk about vaccine and the way the vaccine is playing out even today, I mean we must give credit to this kind of a kind of an enormous effort that was done in basic science, which has kind of a phenomenal impact on the society. So we have to look at these kind of developments. Similarly, Edison. I mean, I mean, look at it. It may not be a great uh, research. But what he did was having such a huge impact in terms of developing an uh, enterprise, which is became a, a $220 billion G was credited to Edison. And when he said that 73 times he failed before he made this incandescent lamp, he said, no, 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 I didn't fail 73 times, but I learned how to make it for 73 times. And that's a great kind of a statement. So what happens is when we look at it, and I'm saying it, I mean, with, with all my humility, that Indian R&D, whether it is in the economy or industrial, is remaining in a kind of average because I think we are not able to put this a connect between the, 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 the societal problems, the industrial problem, creation of the wealth with the basic science. So therefore, I always talk about that ultimately, whether you start from the left side or the right side, important thing is that we need to develop uh, improved technology while we actually do the publications or whatever that we want to understand in terms of the improved understanding. We cannot be doing only one side of the science without understanding that science has to go into the other side. But if it is so, where are we failing? Actually, my analysis, and that's one of the reasons that I've now shifted back from after, after about nearly four and a half decades of working in the industry. I started with atomic energy, BRC, 20 odd years of working in a, in, a, in, a, uh, in a holy place of a science of the country, then moved to NTPC, took some time in IIT Bombay and came back to Thermax as, a, as a, one of the leading corporate sector and now going back to academia, I realized that the basic value of that that we actually get is in this particular area of uh, TR level four to six. And this is the place where neither the academia 
nor the industry are able to take ownership. And because of this particular problem, where you have to actually take your technology to the relevant field environment, what we call prototyping, and very often the business fields or the industry fields, that is the academia job to show it in the real life, and academia field that taking it out of the lab and putting it in the in the prototype in the industry uh, in the in the in the actual real life is the uh, is the in the industrial industries uh, industries problem and that's where i think this uh, tr level four to five to six is where whenever i have this dialogue between academia and, and and the industry is this no man's island which we need to really bridge in fact that's something which i was talking to professor ram gopal rao of id delhi that i want to build this whole strength of building prototyping prototyping and prototyping more prototyping of whatever concepts great concept which is happening in all over the indian academia and bring the industry always on board in this level so what I'm suggesting is that one of the major thing that is required, major, I would say, a revolutionary thing is required, that we need to run these two wheels simultaneously. Industry cannot sit on its own kind of a saying that let R&D, let academia build certain technology, and then we will see only at the end, because then they're looking for somebody who has developed elsewhere in the uh, in the world. We can get that technology directly, and I, I can talk to you uh, about the perils of uh, importing the technology. We need to do this wheel simultaneously. So industry need to have the competence to understand what is happening in the academia. And academia should appreciate what is it ultimately required in terms of the speed, because today you cannot be in a comfort zone of doing R&D endlessly. Everything like you see now, whether it is the vaccine, February 2020, you can look at the genetic sequencing and what was done as an mRNA, and I'm not going there, I'm not an expert in this field. And today, by December, we have got this kind of a mRNA-based vaccine, or even the, I don't know, based viral vaccine, what AstraZeneca and, and my own serum research, is, I mean, the, the my own city, where Serum Research Institute is, uh, is located, is doing it, is only because there's an international collaboration, number one, and then the industry took a, took a risk of manufacturing the vaccines, even while it was getting developed in the laboratory. So if we can take lessons from these developments, I think we can really, really do many things. I think this is something, there's a fair amount of understanding now in Delhi, and I'm going to be in Delhi for, my, my, for, for bringing this kind of a policy makers, but it is important, it is important that, uh, that we should have that uh, synaptic uh, understanding between the, the centers of individuality to the connection and how do we really mimic this whole thing and bringing this golden triangle back into this thing. There are success stories um, in India. I mean, I can talk about atomic energy. I can talk about defense. I can talk about the space. I can talk about Amul. I can talk about many, many success stories. Uh, but I think when you look at it, we can look at how many Einstein's and Ramanujan's and, 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 and C.B. Raman's we have lost. I mean, look at this um, Subhash Mukhopadhyay who created a test tube baby uh, and wonderful thing. I mean, he did it far ahead of anybody of his peers globally, Subhash Mukhopadhyay. And then we had to we, we had to make that egg doctor came out and I'm sure many of this uh, resonates well with the audience here because he had to commit suicide because he was rubbish. He was, uh, he, 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 I mean, scientific community felt that uh, that that he has not done the original work. He was ridiculed, and there were issues of setbacks. And finally, he had to commit uh, a suicide. And uh, today, when we talk about uh, Durga or whatever uh, uh, this Kanupriya Agarwal he created, which was far ahead of what happened and who took a leadership in UK, I think we forgot this particular. And today, if you read what Ratan Tata has written, hello, Ratan Tata has written about the lost, uh, lost opportunities in India. I think we have lost many of these these Einstein's and, 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 and Ramanujan's. It is not that we don't have an intellect. If you look at India's average intellect, may not be very high, 84, 85. But India, if you talk about intellect uh, quotient, IQ above 100, at least 3.5% of Indian population, it has been verified, is having an intellect above 105, which means 
about about 40 40 uh, million people have got this intellect which is almost equal to half of germany or many of the european nations put together where india has got that intellect which equals all the population of uh, many nations of, of the of, of the developed world which is claiming that they 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 are developed because they have got a high intellectual capital available so india has got this capital available but we are losing them because somewhere we are not connecting. Today, if you look at again the Indian Express saying that a lot of people have gone abroad, I think it is good that people go abroad, but somehow we lose them because they are not able to connect back uh, the people who have worked. Number one, of course, many times they don't come back to SNG. Hello? Can, 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 can you uh, switch off? Can you be in, on, on uh, mute, please? I think that I'm getting some, some eco. Uh, Avijit, is it okay? My, my, uh, my, my, this thing is okay, Avijit? Hello. Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. All right. Where is it? Uh, okay. So you can look at these kind of development that has happened in uh, India, which have, I mean, you look at even this Matu pump, which was Sholapur, a mechanic created, which has become a leader. And how many of us know this particular, uh, particular hand pump, which is now a big, big race in, in African subcontinent, where millions of these uh, Sholapur pumps uh, created by this uh, uh, mechanic in, in this thing became a United Nations, uh, UNICEF's uh, major kind of a symbol. You can look at India was a forefront in bio and digital sciences. And we have heard this story again and again, that there have been a pockets of a, a pockets of excellence, but some of we have not been able to connect all these pockets of excellence. And probably that's the reason, I mean, you look at this Dr. Laji Singh from CCMB in Hyderabad, what he created with sequencing, which has become such an important uh, tool today, if I had to know in 20 years from now, which of my gene can become a rogue and I may get Alzheimer or any kind of a malignant uh, tumor, I can do it today and take pre pre preventive action is a wonderful sequencing, which is now available to a common man. And that was something which was started in India way back, but we could not take a leadership. And I can tell you in super critical in optical design in various cutting edge technologies. We had excellent people, excellent researchers, excellent knowledge, but we could not really convert that. We could do it in atomic energy. I mean, I, I, I say it with a lot of pride because this technology was denied. Technology was not available to us. And whenever technology was not available, I think we did it uh, because we had the guts and gumption to do it. We connected collaboratively. I know when I was developing a complex heavy water plant, it's one of the most complex cascade because of the fact that you have to develop a, a, a separate a one atom out of 7,000 atoms of deuterium. And I'll not go there because that's something which excites me to talk about the technology development that we did. And we had to do it in scale. I mean, we needed for a thumb, for a PSW pressure heavy water re reactor, we need a tonnage uh, um, for every megawatt. We need 0.8 tons of uh, heavy water and a huge quantity at a high purity and containing from a, from a very low raw material uh, available and the separation factor being 1.014. How do you develop a, a commercial plan? And we did it. I mean, we all coming from young institutions because there was an iconic leadership, there were resources available, but most importantly, there was a, a collaborative spirit which was flying. So my appeal to the community, uh, to, to a chemical engineering community and the engineering community, let's not outsource our basic R&D. A lot of R&D is getting happening by an outsourcing of R&D in India, but let's not reverse outsource it to outside and be dependent on importing of the technology, which still remains because we want a proven technology in many of the, the so-called public sectors. I think we need to be aware of the dangers of importing technology where we pay money because it is going to be cheaper for creation of knowledge and generating a, 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 a twofold wealth elsewhere. Eventually, we end up in losing our resources. Now, having said this, and before I come back to my concluding part, I want to bring this new wave technologies and I want to take, I know that energy and climate change, digital technologies, bioengineering, water, air, automobile, but I want to take maybe 10 minutes to explain to you the exciting thing that is happening in the climate change technology. So with your permission, now I want to talk about this uh, new transition. Probably the corona, if it has one 
thing that it has done to all the humanity is the respect to nature is so important that we cannot be just running a GDP or an economy without respecting the ecology or the environment. I think that's one of the important, uh, uh, important lessons that we have got. And one more thing is it has kind of created a level playing field. Today, if India is going to usher up this new technology of hydrogen or, or the new wave technologies where we are going to take care of the India's energy security, climate change obligations, and build our uh, technology, uh, technology uh, leadership, I think India can, can, can indeed take a huge, uh, huge leadership. I have kind of imagined the future world could be renewable energy in electricity in all forms, or it could be hydrogen as another way that all the electricity, all the energy will be expressed in the form of hydrogen as an energy carrier rather than electrons. You can talk about protons as an energy carrier. And number three, it could be a hybrid. But with, with a very clear understanding that there has to be a, a, a in our energy transition because there's already a, 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 a CO2 concentration of the order of 410 ppm in the air, which is nearing the tipping point. We need to kind of reduce that carbon dioxide concentrations either from a, from a point source or from the air is something where multiple technologies are required. So I am talking about the future world can have scenario one, scenario two, or scenario three, and we will have maybe next to two two decades for this kind of a hybrid. And it's a very, very crucial time for all technology scientists, society to look at this energy transition because there is no dialogue which is happening without the understanding about this need of energy, more need of energy for a country, growing country like India. And that energy has to be a clean energy, but we can't have all the clean energy coming from renewable energy. And therefore we need to develop with our India's abundant available coal. But how do you make that coal green? What do you take care of the carbon dioxide? These are all multiple things, my dear friends. I'm telling you, I'm, I'm completely seized off working with various organizations, international organization, Indian academia, working with Niti Aayog and various places and various ministries to look at what is it. And if you look at these five elements of generation, transmission, distribution, energy storage, hydrogen, you'll find there is, I mean, I would say avalanche of innovations which are happening. It's a huge fertile place for the young people to come out and, and start their deep, uh, deep tech uh, startups and incubation centers. The number, I mean, look at this particular uh, PV. I mean, we talked about silicon has reached its uh, saturation point where today silicon PV is able to deliver you a power at uh, two rupee 50 paisa per unit. And today, when we said that two rupee fifty pesos is the cheapest power, and before we could take a breath, now you sign that the, the perovskites on a thin film at three micron perovskites is able to deliver power uh, at a cost of three dollar cents. I'm repeating again, three dollar cents, which would mean that eventually renewable power generation point will be free. I mean, it could be 20, 30 pesa per unit of electricity. So that means that the whole way the electricity will be generated from a huge, big size thermal power plants or the nuclear plants will get completely uh, modified into a, uh, into a smaller plants or the so solar plants which are so cheap that end of the day, the challenge will be energy storage. So what could be the energy storage te technologies? Would it be a flow batteries using vanadium or ferrochrome? or whether it is going to be hydrogen. I think this is where there's a tremendous amount of lively, vital discussion which are taking place. Uh, I'm working, I'm a chairman of this hydrogen and methanol committee for the government of India and looking at this aspect about whether we should go for a grid-based uh, uh, technologies of, uh, of, uh, of uh, flow batteries, and then does the, uh, the does our grid is capable of taking this kind of a thing? Whether the grid balancing very well is done from here, or we should do a hydrogen? I'm not again for want of time getting into the details. Uh, as I said here, electricity tra transmission to a electricity become gas transmission. So once you talk about hydrogen and a renewable hydrogen, I think it is a feast for chemical engineering fraternity because there are number of ways. I'm not even talking about water electrolysis. There could be palladium based. There could be a, a platinum based. There are huge number of innovations. And today, people are talking about developing a, 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 a thousand tons of uh, per day hydrogen to be delivered at less than two dollars or less than 150 rupees a kilo of hydrogen. And if you are able to meet that 
and then converted hydrogen into methane or methanol or fischer trots or, 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 or as ammonia as a hydrogen carrier rather than running a cross country high pressure uh, hydrogen tubing, hydrogen piping, sorry, hydrogen piping and hydrogen storage systems. If we're able to convert hydrogen into a high intensity, low carbon methanol or ethanol or methane or dimethyl ether or FT products or even ammonia, that's what is happening. And that's the play where a lot of chemical engineering activity is going to happen. And that is something which is important <clears throat> in the renewable. And at the same time, India has now announced a very favorable policy for a coal gasification. Again, uh, I'm not getting into the details of this coal gasification and how does this work, but this coal gasification will again enable us to kind of generate a high efficiency hydrogen synthesis gas and also ensure that the carbon dioxide can be captured. And I'm running a program with CSI Laboratories. I'm their advisor to develop a center of excellence in carbon capture and utilization where you can take that carbon dioxide, convert into direct uh, 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 direct use or convert it into fine chemical, bulk chemical, plastics, minerals, minerals, and of course fuel. So I'm giving this 80% fuel and 20% kind of a thing. And today, if you are able to use this CDI-based system or a solid oxide electrolyzer so that you don't uh, only uh, get hydrogen from a renewable energy, but you get hydrogen and carbon dioxide simultaneously using this rare earth-based uh, solid oxide. And that is something which uh, I'm going to start a pilot program. You can see thermodynamically because rather than converting hydrogen and mixing CO2 hydrogen at a reactor and using some of the uh, ruthenium and a copper zinc catalyst, if you're able to convert that using this uh, uh, renewable electricity, you can see thermodynamically how much higher efficiency you can get. And probably that is the best way you can fix carbon dioxide using this simultaneous reduction, either through an electrical, uh, I mean, converting through a, a, a PV process or through a solar thermal process. So this is something very important. And there's a big program we want to generate for a carbon dioxide capture from steel industry, cement industry, because all the big industries are also contributing almost 20% of the, of the carbon dioxide into the power industries, steel industry, I mean, the, the, the bulk industries and the transport. So we have to look at all the three sections, power plants, we can ca ca capture CO2, from the steel plants, we can capture CO2 or use that in the form of a very different way of a new way of green steel making, or you can also develop uh, e-mobility. So there are a number of areas where we are going to transit and these are all fertile land for chemical engineers because there's a capture, there's SOAC, there's a conversion. Then again, you take it using the existing uh, liquid transport system so that you don't have to develop uh, either a huge high pressure piping for hydrogen or you carry out a renewable energy and use that CO2, which is coming out in the form of uh, uh, liquids. It could be ammonia, it could be methanol. And if it is methanol, you can again develop a metal organic MOFs or uh, zeolites to absorb that carbon dioxide, which can be converted into some chemicals or later on, as I've shown here, it can become a closed loop cycle once you are taken care of uh, CO2. So there's a program for carbon capture and a novel CO2 capturing technology using one amine or different steer, uh, sterically hindered hinder amines at the point source and at the distributed source using some of those MOFs. Direct capture from air using some of this new technology of a potassium hydroxide, carbon di uh, car carbon di uh, 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 I mean calcium hydroxide. These are all very nice. And today people are not talking about R&D or milligram scale. People are building ton scale, these kind of plants. Hydrogen, coal gasification, biomass gasification, electrolysis, dual bed Syria, I think, I'm suggesting to the government that India should plan 25 million tons per annum of hydrogen production, which can almost meet 50% uh, of India's crude import by using renewable energy and a clean fossil energy and a biomass. So distributed hydrogen plants at 2TPD is one more area that we are working on. There's again a, 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 a tremendous amount of oxyblone gasifier and, 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 and AGRs and, and pressure swing adsorption. So there is something which we can develop and if the biomass is available to you as a, as a residue or a agro residue or agro waste, then you can generate hydrogen Definitely by this technology at a distributed scale, less than $2 or, or 150 rupees. I got a, a, a complete blueprint for preparing this. And this can become a huge kind of a, a enterprise 
for every kind of a community level or maybe every 10 square kilometers, we can have such plants which can meet the local energy requirement for the transport, for the agriculture and for the industries. So there are another conversion, we have developed this kind of a dual bed the gasifier. Uh, pyrolysis on the outside and a bubbling bed. Uh, um, uh, I mean, pyrolysis in the center and bu bubbling bed outside with a zero water, which is known as a gas cleanup system. Hybrid hydrogen, there's a big plan that we are working with IIT Delhi and Government of India, DSG and uh, Niti Aayog. Uh, in fact, there's a tremendous amount of interest in developing coal, clean coal, take that carbon dioxide, convert it into methanol and develop a Indian high ash coal, what we, are, what we call it as a circulating fluid bed technology with our own cleanup, which will be able to meet the methanol production, what is available today globally under 20 rupees. So there are some of these glimpses of the plan, which is now getting into production. And of course, use of the hydrogen ultimately as fuel cell for telecom sector, for residential, for mobility are the other areas. We are developing, as I showed you in the opening thing about the fuel cell that we have developed high temperature because that high temperature, because it operates at 170 degrees centigrade, gives us a good quality heat, which can be converted into cooling and heating as a, as a micro CHP will mean that for every kilowatt hour that you're putting as an energy from, from any, any kind of a fuel, you can get 75% of that particular fuel at a, at a kilowatt scale converted into electricity and heating and cooling, which is going to be one of the important things because when you know in India, 35% of the energy goes for air conditioning. You can use these kind of system which can generate electricity and cooling and give you a tremendous amount of thing. And if you are able to get hydrogen at, at let's say 150 rupees and you get 75% as an overall efficiency, the power that is generated here going to be less than six to seven rupees, which is going to be cheaper than solar power with lithium ion batteries, because this is going to be much more convenient because it's going to be developing. Again, I'm not getting the details of how we have developed this whole from a fundamental electrode. This was done with the active collaboration with the NCL under the NMITLI program, uh, Karaikudi and NPL and IIT Delhi and IIT Gandhinagar and Thermax and BS. So there's a multiple thing that we did just in two years time, we could develop from first principles. And we also developed the onboard reformer, which can be converted into, into this thing, because once you've got a reformer, then you don't have to have hydrogen to be, uh, to be uh, transported or stored and the safety and the other aspects. So these are all some of the, uh, some of the components that have gone into this development of our uh, thing. Onboard reformer, as I said, is Another big development, this is at 7.5 kilowatt level methanol reformer. These are some of the uh, components which have gone into integration. Again, I'm not getting the details of this development at this stage, uh, which we have built in our system. So, and hydrogen fuel cell as a, as a technology is a multi-physics interplay between materials and electrochemistry. Again, you can see here platinum, carbon, catalyst, ink, uh, coating processes, uh, diffusion layers, graphitic system, um, mechanical engineering, designing of the seals. I mean, it's, it's a crazy thing for last two years. I was so involved, kind of it showed the tremendous amount of interaction that is required. And we actually, in a shortest period of time, it's credit to the uh, technologists and engineers of this country. And these are the kind of things which should become our success stories, which we should mimic. And we actually dedicated it to the, to the system. So coming back to my closing remarks, India should become innovation capital to make it a technology powerhouse. We need to have a strong innovation system. We need to have this twin uh, 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 spinning theory of wheels, what some people call it a triple helix, but I, I prefer to call it as a two wheels should run simultaneously. Industry cannot say that I will not be getting involved at the basic level. And academia should also understand that every development has got a commercial value and they must understand how this commercial value, what we talk about circular economy or whether you talk about a sustainability, academia cannot, uh, cannot uh, 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 I mean, abdicate their, uh, their uh, understanding of the economics, even at the stage where they are building at the academic level. And industry at the same time should have to support the academia how to guide them to understand that every development should have to be having certain amount of commercial thing and their willingness to get into the manufacturing and the prototyping is very important. Liberal funding and less of bureaucracy mission program. And that's something which I've taken up as my own kind of a thing. So essentially today, 21st century paradigm is innovation, innovation, innovation. 
discovery innovations inventions are happening how do you integrate this multi physics as i talked about my fuel cell it was nothing but integration at the system level and required a huge amount of thing which would mean that you can't just remain problem solver problem finder or implementers which is most of the thing happen we are talking about a complex problem with unpredictable outcome i mean if at all one thing that i'm giving uh, telling about the future is going to be very complex with unpredictability because of so much of a so much of a uh, development and disruptions are happening and you got to be integrator so you need to have tremendous amount of ideas create a climate for experimentation battle with failure fallacy increase the batting average and this thing so i always talk about this uh, important thing when you talk about a circular economy which should become a part of our economic how do you bring the second law of thermodynamics into a sport so that we are able to actually get uh, the numerator very high at a lower uh, 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 lower denominator more from less is the essence of innovation i can talk to you about various things when elon musk brought that space reusable rocket you could do it at one tenth cost there are number of examples even in india where we talked about this prosthetic put and so many things where indians know how to do a frugal way of engineering uh, today we talk about electricity you can become a electricity generator and consumer what you call prosumer by multiple technology heat pumping technology geothermal technologies uh, solar thermal technology solar pv waste water anaerobic system bioengineering so there are number of things which are very important so in conclusion between the business as usual business but usual debate the reality will be somewhere between that so whole thing will not be business as usual some people say that oh post corona everybody will go back to their business as usual i think people have realized the perils of this climate change which is not going to honor any boundaries like the way corona virus has not honored any it 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 it, it is a very arrogant kind of a virus similarly carbon dioxide is not going to kind of uh, honor any boundaries so you need to understand that it will not be business as usual entrepreneurs and innovators will dictate the future course with scientists so we need, we are entering into a huge period of uncertainty uh, climate change is for real new wave technologies i gave one example in the hydrogen there are number of technology whether it's the perovskites or whether it's the flow batteries or whether it's the hydrogen whether it's the catalyst or whether it's going to be a carbon capture there are huge number of innovations at galore which we need to this thing and we can do it only when we are globally connected so towards a greener landscape we need a tremendous change in the education system i think i'm sure everybody knows the new uh, education uh, uh, policy where we need to bring this this hands on experience r and d expenditure hr policies ip labor reforms so this is a huge amount of changes that are required so next 100 years will we survive from in the uh, in the current form nuclear bomb climate change artificial intelligence are dangerous to the humanity as harari said says and i really appreciate what he says in his graphic design which is the latest book we took 4.3 billion years based on natural selection and organic intelligence so all of our intelligence was carbon or organic wow. intelligence and today we are moving from artificial intelligence to bioengineering where we are challenging the natural selection process and that's where we are developing this so let wisdom prevail to all of us as we is said in other way that we must learn to happily progress together or miserably perish man can live individually but can survive only collectively thank you very much uh, for this for uh, to go to the organizers uh, for the next session thank you so am i audible yes you are uh uh sunday ji for your community talk so now the uh, forum is open for the discussion if so i am requesting of the delegates or participants if anyone having any query please put for one or two quick uh, the your query to our sunday ji so it would be clarify from the sunday sir If anyone having any query, please. There are some chat box, uh, uh, Avijit. Yeah, you can write in the chat box. So one from uh, Nikhil that uh, can you suggest few projects on which student can work, especially uh, specifically catalyst design related in hydrogen production. 
well, let him get in touch with me on a separate email mm -hmm. because uh, there are thousands of pro uh, projects that uh, uh, that can be converted for all this hydrogen and uh, and other things. So maybe if you can get in touch with me on my email, I will be able to suggest some of the projects. Uh, Abhijit. So, uh, yeah. okay, so uh, to uh, all the uh, participants, because it is available in our program schedule, and then we will be posting to the web program schedule after Chemcon, so email ID will be getting, no problem. So, if I think uh, if there is no question, okay, sir, another question I can take it from how does the new education educational policy going to affect? Our education system. So I. I think uh, I just understood that there is a certain kind of a, 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 a limitations in the way the education uh, has been uh, presented. My call is time, so I don't want to go there. But I think all of you have realized that the pedagogy of teaching has changed today. Okay. You've seen this in the, in the last uh, last few this thing. So clearly, what is important today is more of experimentation. So people need to build at a young age their capability to experiment, to their capability to actually have a hands-on experience, their capability to fail in many of these things. So it is not going to be a, a classroom kind of a lecture that is going to be important. That's going to be true even in IITs. No classroom lectures. Classroom lectures could be very minimum. It's more going to be a project experience, trying to work out on, on, on your own thing. And that's the core or fundamental of the new education system, which will create this kind of an enterprise or entrepreneurship in, in people. Very much. I think uh, this is just uh, the discussion session. So we'll be uh, considering your uh, the query and we'll be forwarding to the our Sunday sir and it can be well addressed in later stage. So now we'll be proceeding to our and uh, before going thanks to our Sundayji for accepting our invitation from his busy schedule and delivering this wonderful memorial lectures and make this event a successful through this online. It would have been more happy from. Our uh, able to get a chance to felicitation of the Sunday sir physically, but due to this situation, we can't do anything. So I hope next time, uh, whenever the situation during the, our ChemCon or SCMCon, any of the event of ISEG, so uh, memorable. So thank you very much. Once again, now, uh, CK Murthy Memorial you. Lecture. Session, I am requesting our citation of late Shike Murthy. If you uh, give me permit, can I kind of uh, jump out of this discussion? I can be there for the next 15 minutes. Otherwise, I would like to take a leave of uh, thing from all of you. Uh, wish you a very happy new year. And happy season's greetings. Stay safe and stay healthy. Thank you. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. It's our. I think. Uh, I'm gonna... Okay, I think maybe sir is busy. Ah, it is there. Sir. Hello. Hello. Yeah, the, this is the Vansha. Can you hear me? Uh, I think due to some technical problem, we are unable to. Sir, connect. How is it? Yes, yes. Please, sir. Please, sir. I have to read the Sikamuti. Where is it? Abhijit. Abhijit. 
अभिजीत हाँ सर आई हैव टू रीड दिस सी के मूर्ति में बैठे था हेलो अभिजीत Yes, sir. You please read that. Okay, okay. <coughs> Good evening, all of you. I am Dr. M. Mangta Sarao, Council Member and Vice President for the year 2020. I am reading the bio data of Sintia Sintia Lal Krishna Murthy. Sintia Lal Krishna Murthy, familiarly known as C. K. Murthy. in whose memory this lecture has been arranged today was born on 1st may 1941 at madhavaram in west godavari district of andhra pradesh in a family of cultivators reputed for their philanthropy and nobility he had a brilliant academic career from his early age securing high distinctions in his, in his educational pursuits he obtained his btech chemical engineering with the honors from the andhra university in 1963 and mtech chemical engineering from iit bombay in 1965 later he did his ms mechanical engineering at university of calgary canada all with high distinctions after graduation he was associated with various petrochemical consultancy organizations in canada holding responsible positions these include lumus kelag lor canada and smc group etc before his death he worked as the principal process design engineer in smc group holding a high degree of responsibility and had a total experience of 17 years in the field of design development and the erection of chemical plant equipment a glorious career suddenly came to an end on 30th april 1984 in canada with the sad demise of ck murthy due to cancer from his early days he liberally donated to several philanthropic causes serving the poor and downtrodden notable among them being the one establishment of college to meet the education needs two establishment of primary health care center to meet the health needs and three a temple at the his native place madhavaram this lecture has been instituted by his brother professor c ayanna who is my teacher at andhra university former head of the department of chemical engineering andhra university visakhapatnam and the past vice president of iache to serve to serve as a befitting memory of his late brother ck murthy from the year 2006 the lecture is called inventor ck murthy memorial lecture that is inventor chemicals limited being principal sponsor for this lecture okay thank you thank you one and all okay ajit can proceed next hello avijit hello can proceed thank you sir uh, so i am requesting for delivering the inventa ck murthy memorial lectures thanks to devansu bhattacharya ji for accepting our invitation and this is a very odd time from there so still uh, uh, he may be sir please uh, proceed with your presentation all right um can you see the presentation can you confirm somebody please yes sir it's it's uh, visible sir 
All right, okay, thank you. Should I start? Uh, it's four, I think we have about five minutes or whatever. Should I go ahead or should I wait for another five minutes, please? I think we can start it, please. I think that will be better. Okay, okay, that sounds good. Sure. Hello? Yep. Okay, good evening, everybody. Um, at, the, at the very outset, I would like to thank uh, the organizers and all of you to give me the opportunity to deliver the prestigious Inventor CK Murthy Memorial Lecture at uh, ChemCon, uh, ChemCon 2020. Um, unfortunately, because of the current situations, um, not able to meet all of you in person, so you hope to do that in the future. And uh, uh, this is, I'm really, really, really honored and privileged uh, to be at this occasion, to be with uh, all of you here. And um, for a second. Okay. Uh, next one. Okay. Um, so I will be mainly talking about an uh, ongoing work that uh, which we have been uh, doing for a good bit of a time. And this is probably even more relevant today um, than ever actually about uh, the post combustion CO2 capture uh, process development. And we'll be talking more about some of the successful collaboration among the academia, industry, and the government, okay? So, um, so the motivation behind uh, this, this work is, if you really see the amount of CO2 that is being released to the atmosphere, in 2019 itself, there was about 36.4 billion ton of CO2 that was released to the atmosphere. In 2020, there was about 7% drop in the CO2 production because of the COVID. I think this may be the only positive news of 2020, really, because, and mainly this was a drop because of the transportation sector and some drop in the manufacturing sector, but not in all countries. Like many of the many of the countries, including India, had about nine to ten percent drop in CO2 production. But not uh, all countries. Like China had about one point five percent drop. So overall, it came to about seven percent drop in the CO2 production. But we really need to do much more than what we have now, and it's going to go back or even expected to even jump up more than the amount of CO2 that was produced in 2019. If you really look into the global atmospheric CO2 concentration, in 2019, it was about 410 ppm volume. And it increased by about 2.5 ppm volume from 2018. So it is increasing at a very fast rate which is not acceptable. But if you really look at the quantity of the CO2 that is very being uh, released to the atmosphere, that is actually massive amount. And so we really need to do something there. The options that which we have is going to be varying depending on which country we are talking about, which region we are talking about and for the for this global warming but you can see that the post combustion co2 capture is one thing among the mix like we are going massively with the renewable energy but also the bioenergy and then also other forms of energy however then the, 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 uh, there are existing capabilities there in all countries 
in terms of the fossil fired power plants. Like in India has got a lot of CO2 producing uh, power plants, UK, US, all European unions, China, all has got massive amount of fossil fired power plants. So one option is that to capture CO2 from those plants. However, the, one of the problem is that these, there are a lot of novel capture technologies that are being developed. Typically as a chemical engineer, we know that it takes about 20 to 30 years for commercialization of a new technology. So it's a, it's a very long period of time that we need to wait for developing these technologies. But right now, we really need to work on this very fast. So one of the thing is that, how can, I commercial, how can we commercialize these novel capture technologies? And what we are really looking at is to reduce the capital cost, operating cost, and we would like to make them rapid dynamic changes. So what, what is really the problem? Our, our objective here is that, can we accelerate the learning through the pilot plan test runs? And how can we do that? We can do this with an optimal design of experiments, okay? One of the biggest problem is that as um, you uh, listened in the previous discussion there, that the practical world, right? So there is a big difference between what we do in the lab scale. The lab scale and the theory, they are very, very, very important. They are the building stone or the founding stone of all the new inventions. So the first concepts come out based on the lab scale, based on the theory, okay? However, when we take it to the next level, which is the commercial level, there is a lot of uncertainties in the scale up because the test in the lab scale does not necessarily uh, reflect all of those. The uncertainties due to the process model, that model is actually then used for designing a power, designing a plant, the model parameters and the measurement data, whatever we are measuring, that itself may not be true, okay? So all of these get reflected. What we can do is that we can collect strategic data through optimal design of experiment. So it can help to quantify uncertainties very accurately and in a faster manner. Because as we all know, the pilot plant test runs cost a lot of money. So <clears throat> unfortunately, we cannot run these test runs for days and days. So that's what we want to collect the strategic data. And then we like to maximize the learning with the fixed set of resources, because we have a constraint on time and the dollar and the amount of solvent and all of that. And we would like to learn as fast as we can, okay? The project that I will be talking about, like all of these are the couple of projects that I'll be talking about. This was all undertaken as part of US Department of Energy's Carbon Capture Simulation Initiative, where we started off with this one. And later on with Carbon Capture Simulation for Industry Impact, okay? These two projects actually uh, was a very, very successful uh, collaboration between the federal labs, the government labs, the academic institutions, and capture technology developers. And then we tested everything in the pilot plant. So this was, this was a lot of people that actually worked together successfully to a common goal, okay? <clears throat> So before I go forward, I would like to quickly give uh, a quick idea about what this carbon capture simulation for industry impact is. <clears throat> there are uh, practically all Department of Energy National Labs, which is working in this area. They work with us, including National Energy Technology Laboratory, Lawrence Livermore, Los Alamos, Pacific Northwest National Lab, and Lawrence Berkeley Lab. In terms of the academic institutions, there are institutions such as Carnegie Mellon, Princeton, University of Texas, Austin, Boston University, now also University of Notre Dame and um, 
several other universities that work with us. There are a lot of industries. As you see that there are also software companies like Aspentech, ANSYS, PAC. On the other hand, there are technology developers, power plants, develop power plants operators, and many other companies that work as part of this consortium. So now I'll be proceeding towards uh, going to deeper, uh, the design of experiment for accelerated learning. The thing that you might be wondering now is that what is the thing that was missing in the previous design of experiment? Because design of experiment is a common stuff that is done always and has, has always been done in the lab scale, in the pilot plan scale. So if you really look into those, typical design of experiment use a space filling approach, okay? So this is mainly considered at the input space. So I say, okay, I can want to, I would like to change the temperature, pressure, flow rate, compositions and all of that. But what is of interest to me is really the output space. So the question really comes is that if I am interested in the output output space, this output space is maybe the percentage of CO2 capture, maybe the energy requirement. So that is the thing that which I am interested in learning. So how can I actually design the input space such that I can learn the output space fast? Okay, there have been some cases where this output space has been considered, but the feedback, like as you are learning from the experimental data, that is not leveraged to update the design of experiment again, okay? So this is the angle that which we are coming from is that we are looking into the output space and then we are learning from the output space real time. So we run some experiment in a pilot plant, collect the data and then use those data to again, design the next set of experiment. That's the idea that which we are trying to do. So how we do that, we have a pro we first develop a process model and then we do the sequential approach. Like we design the experiment, implement in the pilot plant, collect the data, come back and then go back, keep going, updating this again and again. What is the issue in doing that? <clears throat> the main issue in doing that is that there are uncertainties in the planned measurement, the process model, and the model parameter. So these are the three things that which we are really looking at, okay? So the way we are doing this is that with uh, using the Bayesian uncertainty quantification, um, and we will be mainly talking about the solvent-based CO2 capture technologies. So first, if we look into these solvent best capture technologies and we are looking into the modeling of those, look, first we'll observe that at the properties models, we have the chemistry model, thermodynamic model, transport models. Then we have the process model. There we have the kinetic model, hydrodynamic models, and the mass transfer models. And then what we do is that we couple all of them to the next level, which is the tower level or the contactor level to give the steady state and the dynamic process model. However, if we notice here that these, each of these models have their uncertainty. So this uncertainty needs to be quantified. So we do, we need to do the uncertainty quantifications for each one of them. If we look into the data that are coming here, like for example, when I'm doing the properties model here, all the chemistry data or the transport models or the thermodynamic model, this coming from the lab scale, we have a measurement uncertainty in this lab. And also this properties model there themselves has their uncertainties. In the, in the, when we develop the kinetic model or the mass transfer of the hydrodynamic model, these we are, we are conducting uh, experiment in the weighted wall column, the bench scale or the pilot's plant scale. And there is a measurement uncertainty here as well as we have the uncertainty in the process models itself. And then when we are going to the next level, which is the tower level or the overall captured plant level, we have the uncertainty in the pilot plant data. So this is the, these are the situation that which we are actually running into. So the approach that which we do using the Bayesian inference is that I, I would not go into the details of these, but overall idea there is the Bayesian inference, as you know, that it's a very, very 
computationally intensive approach. And one of the thing is that these, when you take these probability density functions and try to take this integral here, which is basically you try to maximize, this is a very computationally expensive approach, okay? And typically the way we are solving is, is using the Markov chain Monte Carlo approach with the Gibbs sampling. However, even then it's a very, very computationally expensive. So the first what we do is that we consider the parameter space and the part for predictor variables. And they, this gives us all the observations that we need to take into consideration. Then we use it to develop a response surface model. So this response surface models is a surrogate model or a lower dimensional model that actually help us to run these test, uh, all, all these Bayesian inference studies. So one point to note here is that we are working real time with the pilot plant. So that means that we need to solve these problems very fast. So all of this work we did on an Amazon EC2 cluster uh, out on the cloud. <clears throat> so the cloud computing really, we had uh, about 10,000 node which readily we could actually expand for the clustering of these approaches so that we could actually solve these problems actually real time. And then finally, what we do is that we proceed forward. And when we have the experimental data with the uncertainty, we actually take that into considerations and we give the posterior parameter distribution. So we start with the prior and then end with the posterior. And then once again, we go ahead and design the experiment. So this is the overall idea, the likelihood function that which we are showing here that actually can change their overall, it proceeds with the maximum a prostatiary type of an objective function, okay? So overall, this is the idea. What you do is that you have the properties model and the process model and the kinetic models. For example, all of these we are propagating through the process simulation. And then this gives you the uncertainties in the CO2 capture energy requirement are the key variables. So this is not a point value. This is a distribution that you are projecting through this model. Okay, so its output is also a distribution. The advantage with the Bayesian inference is that you do not have to assume any Gaussian distribution. So that makes it actually more flexible, but that makes it actually computationally expensive. So you can see that how this distribution transform as they proceed through this process simulations. So we have these corresponding papers that which we have um, published here, which gives you actually a lot of uh, details about the overall technique that which we developed. So just to give you an example, like how it actually looks like. So in the in the vapor liquid equilibrium model for these systems, we are using electrolyte and non-random to liquid thermodynamic model. So first, let's say this is a, the prior distributions of some of the parameters. So this model has got about more than <clears throat> couple of hundred uh, parameters. So what we do actually is that we down select the space by doing a Sobel sensitivity analysis. So let's say this is actually considering a two parameter marginal distribution here. So this is how the prior distribution looks like when we actually go through the Bayesian inference, this is the posterior distribution through the Bayesian inference. So what it actually shows you that there are places which has got, this is the most likely region of these two parameters being together, okay? So similarly, like hydraulic model, Hydraulic model is very important for calculating the holdup in the tower and the pressure drop. And this is the prior distribution, then it goes to the posterior distribution. So once again, it shows you that um, how these posterior distributions are actually uh, get, get transformed as it goes through the Bayesian inference. I'd like to note that these prior distributions are constructed considering a um, Gaussian distribution. Okay, so it's a multivariate Gaussian distribution. That is what is actually how we constructed the prior and then the posterior came directly from the Bayesian inference. <clears throat> so we did our test runs um, at, this, at the top. I'm showing here uh, the National Carbon Capture Center. It's uh, probably about, uh, about 80 miles 
out of uh, Birmingham, Alabama uh, in the US. Then we also did our test run at uh, Technology Center Mongstadt in Norway. Um, this, is, uh, this is a place in the North Sea. And on this left-hand side, they have actually a refinery and they feed these capture unit with the, uh, with, with, with the flue gas from the refinery here. On the, for the National Carbon Capture Center, they actually feed it from a power plant, which is uh, sitting next to it. It's a Southern company power plant. So it's actually the flue gas that is being fed here. This National Carbon Capture Center is a test bed of all CO2 captured technologies that is being developed internationally, including membrane technology, solid jordan based technology, solvent technologies, like all technologies, Department of Energy, is uh, they, ask to go there and basically test your technology using the real flue gas from this power plant. So we did steady state test runs at uh, NCCC as we, as we call it typically. And these at uh, Technology Center Monster, we also did the TCM. At TCM, we did the steady state test run. And then we also did some dynamic test runs at NCCC. So um, what was our goal? We did for the, at NCCC for the steady state test runs, our goal was to develop a predictive model, okay? So what it means is we like to minimize the uncertainty in the model prediction such that we could develop a cost optimal plan design and operation, okay? This is actually, uh, um, this is, all the details about this technique is, is published in the beginning of this year, uh, in 2020 itself, that actually clearly tells you what is the technique that we should develop here. So I'll just quickly go into very quickly just how it goes. And it's, it's a much more detailed and elaborate process than that, but I'll just, just quickly touch here. So basically the idea is that first we do the patient design of experiment using process model and uh, initially with the priors and then updated uh, and the model uncertainty. Then this design of experiment, we actually implement in the pilot plant, collect the experimental data. These experimental data are then used to quantify uh, the uncertainties in the process model by taking into consideration uncertainty in the experimental data. And then we also calculate, consider these uh, posteriors and the model from uncertainty. They go back here, and this is the design of experiment uh, algorithm. And then we calculate the new design of experiment, and then it actually keeps going on. Okay, that's the overall idea what we proceed. So when we did this for the NCCC pilot plan, we actually balance between exploration versus exploitation. So explorations is basically means is the places where you just do not know how the, how the model is going to behave. So I would like to note that everything here is actually reflected in design of experiment. The uncertainties we are reflected by giving the width of the confidence interval. So this is the 95% confidence interval width for, with respect to this what we are considering here. So what we do here is we explore some unknown region and exploit our current understanding of the overall process, okay? So the first set of experiments that which we did is we did it considering something called a mini max design, which means the minima is the largest distance of from any point in the input space to the design space, okay? That's the optimization objective for selecting the specific point out of all the candidate design points in my overall design space. Then what we do is that once we collected these data, so next set, what we did is something known as the G optimality. So G optimality means actually minimizing the worst prediction in the model. So we go there and say, okay, if I'm actually trying to apply this model, like for example, if you look into this right hand side, then it basically says is, which is the places that I have the worst prediction from the model. So if you look here, I have a very worst prediction over here. 
what's prediction over here, what's prediction over here. So the question is, why do I not select this point? Well, this is what actually goes into this algorithm. It says that if you place a experimental point over here and over here, you will automatically learn something over here and you will learn over here. So you do not really need to run an experiment here, over here. So this is the overall idea that this algorithm actually keeps going. So this goes you, shows you some of the um, uh, comparison of the experimental uh, result versus our model results. So the NCCC absorber is, is very flexible. So when the uh, Department of Energy actually funded that pilot plant many years back, I think it was uh, established like about 20 years back, it was developed in such a way that it remained flexible because all technology developers, they will have, they would like to have their own flexibility. So you can change the plant in many different ways. So, and we, we took advantage of those flexibilities. So the absorber can have, absorber has three bed, but at a time, if you like, you can run only one bed or the two bed or the three bed. And then in between two absorber bed, you can use an intercooling option. So the intercooling is advantageous because as we know, the all absorption process is exothermic process, right? Because it is exothermic process, the temperature of the system goes up. And for a solvent system, if the temperature goes up, the solvent capacity or the from a vapor liquid equilibrium point of perspective, it goes down, right? So the intercooling can actually help to cap for the CO2 capture to go up. So this is basically the parity plot showing for the three bed. And this is one of the two bed and we are using this blue and the green dots over here. So what you can note here is that we are spanning between about 55, 60% to all the way up to about 97, 98% CO2 capture for all of these. And these are the percentage error that which we had there. Now, this is the how the first, this, this is the really the main plot that shows you how it works, okay? So this is the uncertainty with my prior distribution. That basically means is before I ran any experiment in the pilot plan, this was my overall uncertainty. So it basically says, okay, like here you can see that these some of these places I have a very high uncertainty overall here, okay? And then when you run the experiment, then what happens is that these uncertainties actually shrink. So you see that these curves is actually goes down. And so what it means is I learned and because I learned from the new experiment, my overall confidence in my model went up. That's the main outcome over here. Interestingly, if you notice here, like there is a point over here, there is a point over here. What you can see is that this point, it's still something which we did not learn or we, we still do not know. So overall on an average sense, my learning went up but then there are some points where there are still a lot of uncertainties. So, so that is, it happened for all the points. However, we only ran about 15 experiments here. So these are the actual experimental points. So if you look into these experimental points over here, this was the original uncertainty when we collected these uh, uh, data and processed it, then my overall confidence in the model went up or uncertainty went down, okay? <clears throat> so this actually then shows the next iteration. And as I said, so we had really uh, opportunity for running like two iteration in the pilot plant. And then in the next iterations, what we see is that we placed only three points over here. So it shows you the prior for these, and then corresponding to the posteriors, what we find is once again, with these three uh, po points itself, I had a good bit of a learning here, which is getting reflected. So these are the three points for which we collected the data, but on an overall sense, you see, this is my entire design space. 
So the uncertainty in the entire design space actually got improved. So you now can see that these big or the large uncertainties there do not appear here. Okay, so we identified through the first iteration that we really have some lack of knowledge in these around these experimental conditions. So we selected these points over here, which you see that some of these large values over here. Once we actually use those, we learned about what is the source of those uncertainties we incorporated in the model, and then we see that we have a better confidence in the model itself. Okay. Then we went ahead. So this was very, very, we were, we were very excited to see that it really happened in the in the pilot plan. Because to be honest with you, a lot of these concepts came from our group and we are a bit nervous actually saying that, well, let's see, these are theoretical ideas. Will it actually work in pilot plan and what will be the outcome? So we are a bit nervous there, but it actually went out really very nicely. So then these, we are also part of the international consortium. So they were very excited to seeing these results, which is the technology center amongst that. This is the world's largest pilot plant. Okay. Um, and this is, yeah, right now actually we have been running a bunch of other experiment in this technology center amongst that in Norway. And so this, they are, um, so the idea there was they actually give us a very interesting objective. They basically says that a lot of technology developers come to our pilot plant. They would like to know their optimal operating condition in minimum number of experimental run. Because each pilot plan run costs a lot of money, right? So all our technology development learn to know what is the minimum test run they would like to do to find out the best case operating condition for their system. So we took up this uh, goal over here and then we basically say what it really mean is that we like to minimize the variance in my model prediction but in the neighborhood of optimal operation. So we have a focused approach not everywhere but around the operating condition. That was the goal. So this was actually four, uh, five overall five phases. In the phase one, we did a space filling type of an approach to learn or explore the region. In the phase two, what we do is that we select this point based on the economic objective function. Remember, as I said, that in this case, the technology developer was actually interested in um, finding the optimal objective very fast. And then we did the sequential design of experiment, as I just said before, which is basically um, like to, uh, with the G-optimality objective that I just uh, described there. And then in next phase, we directly went into the minimization of the reboiler duty. We also uh, use something else also, but I will be, uh, due to interest of time, I will not be talking about some of those. So this is how it actually looks like. So you can see that uh, in phase one and two, how actually the parity plot looks like both for uh, the absorber as well as the stupor. And interestingly, what you will observe over here is that there are some cases there was a big um, discrepancy in the model. So what, what is really going on in these cases, okay? So we actually investigated and see could, I, could our model actually capture these uncertainties and why it failed to capture these uncertainties, okay? So what we found was that there was operational issues at the low solvent rate. So some of these cases we had a very low solvent flow rate there and these are all came from there. So all of these are related to this low solvent flow rate and it was possibly, it was a, it, the packing was probably channeling and it was, we, there was a big discrepancy in the prediction of the model because of some of the channeling issues there. <clears throat> now, if you look into for all other places, all other operating conditions, so once again, just like the NCCC, what we noticed there was that there was a, the uncertainty actually shrank, okay? See, this was the prior confidence interval width and it dropped here, so all of these data points. You see, 
So once again, we found that this is uh, this Bayesian design of experiment led to a drop in the uncertainty or improvement in our confidence in the model. And this is now the actual objective that they were interested in, which is the minimization of the stripper reboiler duty. Okay. So originally, if we am actually using our original model and then use that model for minimizing the duty, this was how the model would have predicted. But as we keep collecting the data, what happened was that this is the new curve. Okay. And you see that now this new curve is much, much closer to the experimental data. So we just collected a couple of data points and then that actually helped us to shift the curve from here to here. So overall, they were actually very uh, interested. And then basically, this is something which we are working with a couple of other uh, commercial vendors that which is actually interested in this overall technique um, so that they can find out the best operating conditions for their technology in a faster manner. <clears throat> Now we did the dynamic test runs. So what is the, why do we want to do this dynamic test runs? So one thing we have to remember that these, the actual capture plant has to change its capture rate very fast because if the, what is we are seeing uh, in the country, like in the, in the US, and in the European Union quite a bit in terms of the renewable energy penetrations, the power plants are always load following. So the load is continuously changing during the daytime when the sun comes out or whenever there is a wind, a lot of wind energy that is getting generated, the power plants will go down. But now if there is a cloud cover on the sun, then immediately the solar power goes down, the power plant has to ramp up. So all power plants in the country are actually just rapidly going up and down. So if you are thinking about a capture plant, that means that the capture plant it has to also quickly keep changing its operating conditions. So that means that it, we would like to understand about the transient operation of the dynamic operation under the load following operation of the power plant or the host plant, whichever, like it may be a cement uh, manufacturing plant that generates a lot of CO2. So it could be because of those, okay? So we like to develop this dynamic model. This, this part of the work we have, we have our dynamic model uh, communicated here in 2019, and we like to get a predictive dynamic model, okay? So wh why we need the dynamic um, test run? So first thing to note here is that if you look into, let's say this is a, this is a dynamical process, and this is the process response, or the process response can be this. When we do the steady state, we are just observing this point when the process has reached the steady state. But we do not know from here to here, how did the process reach the steady state? Did it go like this or did it go like this? Okay, and there could be all kind of trajectory that it can take to reach this. So this trajectory, understanding this trajectory what is, if you look into in terms of partial differential algebraic equation system, this is basically showing here is that when you are doing the test, when you are doing the steady state run, you are putting this time derivative to zero. That means we are unable to observe the left hand side of this, which is the accumulation term here. And that is what is the problem is that is model which is validated for steady state is not necessarily will be predictive for the dynamic cases, okay? So one thought could be coming that, well, why not doing a single step? You can do a single step uh, and then collect the transient data. The problem is the single step is persistently exciting of order one. That means you can just identify only a first order system, but this is a higher dimensional system. So what we really want is that if the order of my system is M, then I need an input signal design that can be exciting for an M order system, okay? This input signal should be planned friendly. The, what it means is I cannot break an equipment because of that. Like for example, if I'm actually trying to change the things very fast, 
it should not lead to a breaking of a compressor or a pump or um, other equipment in, which are very costly. So they should be planned friendly. So first we did these a, a PRBS. These are actually known as the pseudo random binary signal. So this is how this design signal looks like. I would not go into the details of how these are designed, but this is a, I just like to note that this is a two level signal and the signal, the covariance function of these signals has got a similar properties as you will expect for a white noise term. And we would like these PRBS to be completely an IID sequence so that therefore you can see that this is the time delay actually guarantees that they are not correlated with each other, okay? So this is how this thing actually looks like. And this is what you really need to implement in, a, in, the, in the actual pilot plan. Now, when we look into this plant friendliness, so for evaluating the plant friendliness, we do something what we call the worst case prediction. So that to minimize the, what we call the crisp factor. So this is what it basically tells you that basically says you that you keep it bounded and then you go back to your input scale and then you, you do the whole thing so that your overall thing does not lead to or go beyond some worst case process gains. We also design the shorter phased design signals. So what it, these are actually harmonically related sum of sinusoids. And this is like how the solvent flow rate will look like, how the steam flow rate will look like, how the flue gas flow rate will look like. The point to note here is all of these things are changing at the same time like this. At the same time, they have to do all the things at the, at, the, at, the, at the same time. What is the advantage of doing that? The problem is that the pseudo random binary signal that I just described, it might take a long time to implement in a pilot plant. Okay, and these signals, the shorter phase design signal can be very fast actually and can collect a lot of data very quickly. So what it basically, what, here what we consider here is we consider the de-optimality that maximize the differential Shannon information, which is given here like in the, and Shannon information, this comes basically from the one over this Fisher information matrix, which is given by this expectation function with this log likelihood, okay? And then that uh, Fisher information matrix help us to optimally select the design parameters. So, however, when we try to implement in the pilot plant, the problem is that, you know, that this is very difficult to implement in real life. So there was some discrepancy between the actual design signal and the implemented signal. So it was important for us to read back from the actual plant implementation and then reevaluate it. So this is comparing that, how, so these blue lines are the experimental, like for example here, and the red one are our design signal. So you can clearly see that there, there were some spikes over here for each of these input over here. So the question is that because of these spikes, did we lose the properties that which we are actually looking for, okay? So for doing that, we did this power spectrum analysis. So this was our design power, power spectrum. And then here it shows you the actual power spectrum. So what we observe there is the power spectrum is still acceptable and it has the correct strength over the entire frequency range. So even though experimental data were deviated from my design signal, they are still acceptable in terms of their strength, in terms of what we are trying to achieve here. This shows you the shorter phase gathered data. And this was really interesting that we are more worried about the shorter phase signal because we thought pilot plan might have difficulty to implement these. And we actually worked with the pilot plan because we had to modify their control system so that this could be implemented because this is not standard. But the National Carbon Capture Center gives us all the opportunity of the flexibility so that we can change these whichever way I like to. We work with the control engineer to implement all of these. And then it shows that it's a, it's a very nice implementation uh, and uh, not as bad as what we were thinking there. We had some difficulty in the gas flow rate uh, manipulations, but everything else was pretty good. 
Um, and as a result of it, we compared also the power spectrum, and this was actually, again, acceptable. Then this shows you um, that how the results look like. And as you all know that this is a, dynamic data actually fail to satisfy the mass and the energy balances. And that is very critical. So we first actually did a dynamic data reconciliation and parameter estimation. Due to interest of time, I'm actually not talking about this, but these are the result of doing a bunch of other steps before that, that guarantees the mass and the energy balances and remove the noise in the data and all of those. And once we do that, this is basically shows the comparison between the what how the data looks like and how what the model actually predicts. This is for the observer side of the result. This is for the stripper side of the result. And once again, it shows you that how overall uh, things actually behave, okay, at the in this entire operating range. Once again, we found that uh, this was the overall prediction of the model was reasonably good, and we updated the parameters in an optimal manner. The interesting thing what we found through these test runs was that we could learn these through optimal design of experiment only couple of days experimental run that which we actually presented. So overall, this was less than a month study that which we conducted. Usually our experience and based on our discussion of the pilot plants, there are usually six months to a year test runs many of these technology developers do in this typical pilot plants. So we actually, and during this one month period, we actually also um, did both for the steady state and the dynamic test run. So this was, this, this really gave us an accelerated learning. The problem is that because you are working with the pilot plant, the people at your end has to be there like 24 seven and has to really understand the overall algorithm and how it goes. So overall, it's a complicated and in involved algorithm. And then we had a lot of people starting with the software engineer, um, the people who, who handle just the Amazon EC2 cloud computing and all of those. So they took care of a lot of software related issues for us. We worked with statisticians as part of this project worked with the real time with the pilot plant operator, their control engineer and all of this. But overall, this was this this gift this gives us says that you can have an accelerated learning by this optimal design of experiment. Um, this methodology is generic and flexible and I presented only for MEA or monoethanol amine because that's an open solvent. Right now we have been working with bunch of other technology developers. They are developing their proprietary technologies. So obviously we cannot actually disclose that, uh, present that in the public domain. However, that I wanted to say that this is, this is actually, they realize the benefit of this technique. So uh, we right now at National Carbon Capture Center, uh, as well as in Technology Center Mongstad, uh, we are working with European Union, uh, with uh, several universities in UK, Sheffield University, University of Edinburgh, as well as Norway, NTNU and uh, PCM, and Danish and the Swedish universities to actually implement there in multiple pilot plants uh, in Europe, Europe and in the US. We also observe that this dynamic design of experiment can actually provide significant information. So what you could collect in about a month in a steady state test run, the same level of information can be collected in about less than a day by dynamic design of experiment. So it's a massive amount of data that you can collect. However, I would like to caution that it is much, much, much more difficult to extract information out of this dynamic data. You need to have a model, you need to have an algorithm that will be able to process this dynamic data and extract information from there. So this is tricky, but if you have those algorithm developed there, these dynamic test runs can actually cut down the amount of time for test runs by an order of magnitude, okay? We also found that this is the collaborative research among all stakeholders. Like this 
thing. We could never do it without active participations of the government lab. So a lot of the statistics help we got from the Los Alamos National Laboratory and Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. A lot of our, uh, the, all the pilot plant operators, they worked all the time with us as well as other academic institutions. So this is, you, you really need a collaborative research because we do not individually, we do not have all the strength that, or, that we need for doing this type of a research. So it's a collaborative research that is needed and also working alongside of the technology developers is actually very, very important for the commercial CO2 capture technology development, just like any other chemical engineering uh, technology development that is crucial. I'd like to acknowledge from our West Virginia University and National Energy Technology Laboratory, I, I put it as slash because my student, Josh Morgan and Anderson, they are the primarily, they worked uh, on these overall thing. And Josh is the guy who basically was, did not sleep for weeks, <laughs> basically. He kept sleeping in the lab, working on, on these, because this is real time you are working with the pilot plant and uh, they are right now working as part of the federal lab there. Um, and uh, my postdoc, Ben O'Mell, and also from NETL side, Mike Majewski and Dr. David Miller, all of them, Lawrence Livermore, Charles Tong, and Brenda, Los Alamos National Lab, Christine, she is a famous statistician. She worked with us, Sham Bhatt, Taufik, and Jim Gattiker, all from all statistician from Los Alamos National Lab. National Carbon Capture Center. We work with John Carroll, Chiron Jeep Saha, Justin Anthony, and in Technology Center, Bongstead worked with Mohammed, Chris, Chris Benkowit, and Annette. Okay. And finally, uh, I'd like to um, thank US Department of Energy for funding this project. And uh, this is our research group. The, the picture was taken at a time when there was no social distancing protocol. With that, I would like to thank the organizers uh, once again, and I hope that in the future, I would have the opportunity to meet uh, all of you in person, maybe in the next year. And let's pray together that we have a new 2021 when we can be all together like this, okay? We don't need social distancing. And uh, have a very nice and wonderful year, everybody. And I'm open to any questions that you might have. So, hello. Thank you, sir. So, I'm requesting President, sir, to say a few words and thanks to our speaker. Hello, Dibans. Dr. Dibans. Yeah, thanks, Dr. How are you? Uh, uh, I'm fine. How are you? I'm doing pretty good. I can see that all of you are there really together and yeah, yeah. Uh, with all the precautions. Yeah, yes. this is such an unusual time. Thanks a lot for inviting me. This was a, this was a pleasure to... to we, are, we, are, we are very happy. We are happy to hear you. And uh, that early morning during the winter in so cold, you have taken the pains to deliver the lecture. We are very much happy. And, uh, from my sketchy, uh, we thank you for delivering the lecture. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you, sir. And uh, thanks. Well, thank you once again to uh, our uh, Professor Dibansu Bhattacharya for accepting our invitation and delivering such informative uh, and uh, very important yeah. uh, our, uh, de talk. So thank you once again. So now we'll be moving to the, our next uh, sir, sir. Uh, uh, memorial lecture. Wait, wait. Abhijit, yeah. sir. Dr. Dibonsu. Yes. yes. Sir, I am Kishle Kumar. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, he's. Uh... Uh, okay, so actually, we'll be discussing later. Okay, so next memorial lecture, we have to start. Uh, okay. So, speaker, uh, our, the speaker already arrived. So, now we are going to start the next memorial lecture the late Professor Dr. H. L. Roy Memorial Lecture. So before going to start the formal lecture, formal just, lecture just I'll read out the citation.
founder president the indian institute of chemical yeah. engineer icic dine i sir the second day of november has a special significance to chemical engineers in india and numerous others in the in this country and elsewhere elsewhere on this day in 1889 was born in the small village of pachpaika in dhaka now in bangladesh the founding father of chemical engineering education and research in india orphan at at the age of 5 <laughs> This youngest of six brothers had his early schooling in a big middle class joint family where he had perforce to stand more or less on my own legs and to shift for myself without giving offense to anybody he passed the entrance examination from the komila jila school in the first division in 1908 following the hectic days of the swadeshi movement of 1905 the great socio political upheaval which forced the alien rulers to annul the partition of bengal and marked the beginning of the end of british rule in india step in the spirit and idealism of the swadeshi movement in which we took an active part the young hira lal took the vow of swadeshi and service to the motherland and joined the bengal national college of the national council of education in calcutta set up in 1906 as the nucleus of a national yes. university yes. sacrificing a much needed government scholarship and risking the police depression then rampant beside the uncertainty of the future sharing his march alliance and scholarship money and national council provided in lieu of the government scholarship with two other friends with whom he i think so टॉपिंगशन Topping the list of successful candidates while serving temporarily as a teacher at the Malda National School, the NC 1910 decided to send seven of their good students for higher studies abroad, especially in science and technical subjects, to provide itself with a crowd of dedicated teachers on return. And Hiralal was selected for studying chemistry at Harvard. on an allowance of rupees 150 per month and expenses for passage and outfit on the condition that on return he would serve the the nc for at least 7 years on a pay of not less than rupees 100 per month leaving calcutta in august 1910 by a cargo boat he joined howard university where pinching himself to the utmost with his meager allowances he studied for 3 years earning merit scholarship and membership of the phi beta kappa society and finally passed the ab examination with magna cum laude in chemistry hiralal declined offer of a post graduate scholarship at harvard to return to india in august 1913 to serve his alma mater the nc as a teacher of chemistry at the bengal technical institute calcutta here he set himself to the task of introducing chemical engineering as a subject of study on the lines of the massachusetts institute of technology in 1921 and requested the nc to send him again 
to the United States, where along the new discipline was being taught. The NCE, however, could not afford to send him abroad till 1923, and then only to Germany. In August 1923, Hirala left India to join the Technik Hostute at Karlotsburg, Berlin, and return in 1925 with his doctor engineer to serve as the head of the Department of Chemical Engineering at Bengal Technical Institute, which was shifted to the Jadavpur University campus. In June 1924, and renamed the College of Engineering and Technology, Bengal, in 1928. Throughout his lifelong dedicated service, Hiralal stood by his alma mater through all the vicissitudes of its career, accepting poverty as his badge of life, drawing at times even less than the promised minimum of rupees 100 per month. And on retirement in June 1952, received the distinction of Professor Emeritus in 1953, which was later endorsed by the Jadavpur University. When the College of Engineering and Technology developed, into a full-fledged university under the Jadavpur University Act of 1955. Through his pioneering stewardship, chemical engineering studies came to be introduced in many of the Indian universities and institutions, and in later years, through his association with the All India Council of Technical Education, he continued to give his sage counsel and guidance for the advancement of chemical engineering education, the Indian Institute of Chemical Engineers was founded by him in 1974. As the founder president and after serving a second term as elected president in 1953. He continued giving his best for prompting the activities and object, objectives of the Institute till he breathed his last on July 26, 1965. He was elected the first vice president of the British Institute of Chemical Engineers in 1955 to 56. And for a second term in 1957 to 56 to 57, beside being a chairman of advisory panel for India from 1952 to 1955. The true pioneer and idealist that he was Professor Roy, content with plain living and high thinking, spent his life in the midst of his students, working, playing, living, and enjoying life with them. His household was always open to visitors, whether young or old, Indian or foreign, and the simple open-hearted hospitality of his family was for all to enjoy. To his countless students, colleagues, friends, and acquaintances, he was the master, the one bracher, the friend's philosopher and guide, ever, ever ready to listen and help with his quiet confidence and classic composer. His sterling principles and idealism, the depth of his culture, mind, and catholicity of outlook, his noble symptomatic, sympathetic, heart and his sparkling sense of humor, the cleanness of body and mind, mark the aristocracy of his soul and his magnetic personality, which attracted and impressed all. In his own words, with advancing age we are, I hope all may love a little and can face life with more charity and equanimity. None and nothing is absolutely right or absolutely wrong in our present old age. We should be able more easily to forgive and forget. Love all, pity some, hate none. Such was Professor Hira Lal Roy, who scared memory, Indian Institute of Chemical Engineers, respectfully recall in gratitude annually at the HL Roy, Dr. H. L. Roy Memorial Lectures. From the year 2008, 
the lecture is called dr h l roy memorial lecture sponsored by jacobs so now i am requesting uh, professor bala subramaniam to start the memorial lectures please sir now you, you can proceed sir so our speaker from university of kansas so i am requesting to start the memorial lecture so just one moment let me uh, uh, share the screen now yes it is yes, audible sir, sir. Yeah, just one moment. Sir, is there any issue? Is yeah, I'm trying to. <clears throat> have you given me permission to share the screen? <clears throat> it is already there. There, you please try. It was there. Now you can try. Okay, just a moment. I think lighting problem is there. No, no, it is okay, sir. It is visible, sir. No problem. Yeah, just one moment. Let me. Uh... Why he started talking like that? Are you able to see my uh, screen now? Yes, yes, it is visible. And and you are just able to see the slides, right? Right, right, yes, right. Yes, just the slide. Okay. Uh, please well, continue, sir. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, good afternoon to uh, everyone in India. Uh, I know that the uh, pandemic has forced us to be uh, creative and conducting professional conferences virtually. Uh, actually, this is the uh, fifth virtual conference lecture I'm giving this year, uh, but the earliest from my time zone uh, in the United States. Um, uh, and I must also say I've never woken up uh, so early to get uh, ready to give a, a, a lecture, but I'm uh, quite pleased to do so. Uh, I want to first uh, thank uh, Dr. Basavarao, uh, uh, Dr. Balasubramanian, and Dr. Ghosh, uh, and the organizing committee of the Indian Institute of Chemical Engineers uh, for the kind invitation to give this uh, uh, lecture. Uh, are you able to see the next slide? I just want to make sure when I advance, you're able to see that. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. Yeah, OK. So um, uh, you, you heard uh, uh, an excellent uh, uh, introduction uh, to uh, uh, Dr. H.L. Roy, uh, after whom this uh, lecture is uh, named. Uh, 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 as was articulated, he is considered by many as the father of the chemical engineering profession in India. Uh, he uh, initiated the uh, discipline, the chemical engineering uh, degree program almost a century ago uh, foreseeing the need for a chemical industry in India uh, to produce items such as synthetic fertilizers uh, and medicines, among other things. Um, and then he also founded the Indian Institute of Chemical Engineers organization, uh, I believe in 1947, the same year that uh, India got independence. So since the time, since 1921, uh, now almost a century next year, uh, the field of chemical engineering in India has uh, grown in leaps and bounds. Uh, uh, there are many leading industries, uh, reliance industries, Tata Chemicals, uh, many pharmaceutical specialty chemical companies. They are among the world leaders. And I put up this list uh, uh, of uh, past speakers uh, just to uh, uh, 
to reflect the fact that this is a testament to how Indian chemical engineers are making vital uh, contributions worldwide. Um, um, I've had the pleasure to meet and interact with uh, quite a few of these illustrious chemical engineers, uh, especially the ones that I've highlighted here. And uh, among them is my former teacher, uh, Professor uh, uh, G.S. Ladda, uh, who was the founding director of the chemical engineering program at AC College of Technology in India. Uh, I'm indeed very humbled today uh, to be uh, included in this list. While the chemical industry that uh, Dr. Roy had envisioned has grown dramatically in the last century, a major challenge that's confronting humanity today is sustainable development. Uh, in other words, how do we conserve natural resources and protect the planet for current and future generations? That's really the classic definition of sustainability. Now, what I've uh, shown on this slide are the uh, uh, sustainable development goals or SDGs. These are also known as the global goals. And all of them have been adopted by the United Nations member uh, states, and this was done in 2015. Uh, what it is is a universal call uh, to action to end poverty, protect the planet, and ensure that all people, all people, no one left behind, enjoy peace and prosperity by 2030. Now, these 17 goals, um, they are all interconnected, and essentially they call for equitable and sustained supply of basic needs, such as food water, electricity, clothing, medicines, and shelter. This means that the development must balance social, economic, and environmental uh, sustainability. And this is a very ambitious uh, initiative. Mind you, uh, the target is 2030. Uh, but to accomplish this, we'll need concerted action by all the member states and investments of financial resources. Now, one of the things I want, and this is very general, this is not specific to any industry, the U UN Sustainable Development Goals. But if you think about it, the chemical industry currently produces many of the everyday products that ensure our standard of living, including synthetic fertilizers, medicines, clothing materials, building materials, etc. And I might remind you that in 1930, uh, 1913, uh, more than a century ago, when Haber and Bosch from uh, Germany uh, invented the Haber process for making synthetic fertilizers. That was almost a singular event that started the explosion of the world population, uh, removing pop, uh, hunger uh, in particular. And the population was just about 1 billion, I believe, uh, uh, at that time, and now it's 7 billion. So it shows that uh, synthetic fertilizers are needed and they're needed even now to, uh, 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 to eliminate hunger, uh, to sustain uh, the population. And the fertilizer industry indeed is among the uh, largest capacity uh, industry in the uh, world. And it has sustainability issues. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. But the point I wanna make is to achieve these goals, um, uh, one might say that a vibrant and sustainable chemical industry is uh, essential. So what are the challenges uh, facing the chemical industry? Well, um, there is a growing demand for everyday products, uh, whether it's uh, uh, your uh, uh, detergents or your shampoos or your building materials, synthetic fibers uh, or your diapers, etc. cetera. Uh, and this demand is growing uh, quite uh, 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 dramatically. Uh, just to give you an idea, the, the, the chemical output uh, in 2017 was 5 trillion US dollars, and it's expected to double by 2030 because of this demand. And most of the demand is occurring in populous countries like uh, uh, China, uh, India, and uh, those in uh, South America. So that's the first challenge. Uh, how do you meet this growing demand? Um, and of course, you have to meet this demand for sustainable development by eliminating adverse effects on the environment and human health and the ecosystem as well. And, and primarily, these are caused by the uh, fossil-based raw materials. The raw materials for all these products are derived uh, from 
uh, fossil uh, based uh, sources. Uh, and also the energy that's required to power the industry <clears throat> is derived from uh, fossil based materials. Uh, so uh, that's the second challenge. Uh, you know, how do you eliminate that? And the third is that we have a depleting <clears throat> feedstock resource as well. Um, uh, coal or oil or, or <clears throat> natural gas, they are depleting. Maybe they'll be there for one or two more generations, but eventually uh, one has to develop sustainable sources of chemical feedstocks, which means a sustainable carbon source to make these everyday products. And we don't have those technologies right now. So these are the challenges facing the uh, chemical industry. And I talked about the uh, <clears throat> energy intensity of the uh, chemical industry. And I wanna just give you an example <clears throat> of um, uh, the top 18 large volume chemicals. And on the X axis, what you see uh, is the production volume. Uh, and these are uh, in uh, uh, hundreds of thousands of uh, kilotons, which means they are several billion pounds per year. So just imagine that. So the, the, the global capacity for these top 18 large volume chemicals um, are quite high. And on the Y axis, uh, uh, what is shown are the greenhouse gas emissions. <clears throat> and again, this is um, a measure of the energy intensity, how much carbon dioxide is emitted by these uh, collectively uh, by this industry, because they burn currently fossil fuel to power the industry. And these top 18 chemicals are the precursors from which a majority of everyday chemicals are made. And they cumulatively account for 75% of the uh, overall greenhouse gas emissions emitted by the, uh, uh, the industry. And I show on the right axis, uh, the uh, uh, ammonia is out of this chart. So I had to make a, a special axis there. And uh, again, the sheer magnitude of the production capacity is what makes ammonia the largest emitter of uh, carbon dioxide uh, emission in the chemical industry. Uh, and that comes not only with the power required, but also it's emitted as a byproduct because you make the hydrogen needed. So the, uh, the harbor process uses nitrogen and hydrogen to make ammonia, and the hydrogen is uh, obtained from methane, steam reforming of methane, and a co-product is carbon dioxide. So, uh, uh, so there are already uh, efforts underway uh, to uh, synthesize ammonia uh, without this huge carbon footprint uh, that it's uh, uh, leaving behind uh, with the current technology. I also want to put the uh, this energy. Uh, uh, the, the greenhouse gas emissions from the uh, chemical industry in perspective with the transportation sector. The transportation sector is by far the largest emitter of carbon dioxide. The chemical industry is one fifth. Uh, but as we move forward, uh, we have to curb these uh, uh, carbon emissions uh, from all sectors uh, of the industry. So what are we looking at uh, for a sustainable chemical industry? This is the transition. Uh, that we are looking at. So on the left-hand side, I talked about the fossil resources that are currently used, not only for making uh, both the fuels and the chemicals, uh, the fossil resources, gas, oil, and coal, uh, they are the ones that are used as uh, feedstock, um, but they're also used as the power source as shown on the left-hand side. So in a sustainable world or a sustainable chemical industry, those fossil resources must be replaced with renewable carbon resources. So we are talking about plant-based biomass. We are talking about carbon dioxide itself, uh, fixing that carbon back in products and also uh, end of use waste, which are then recycled back. So to promote a circular uh, economy. And we are also talking about um, powering this industry from solar and wind power, renewable sources of uh, of electricity and even hydrogen, which is carbon free. The hydrogen economy is carbon free. So in this way, uh, what we will probably see are not these giant petrochemical refineries that we now have, but distributed biorefineries where chemicals are made from renewable carbon sources 
powered by renew renewable energy, um, close to where uh, these raw materials are available, which means agro-based industries may receive a boost if we may, as we make this transition. And I call it inevitable because today the only known fixed carbon source is plant-based biomass. And carbon source is what we need to make all the everyday materials. So we better learn how to make them and we better start the transition uh, right away uh, if we want to address this uh, challenge. So at the uh, Center for uh, Environmentally Beneficial Catalysis at the University of Kansas, we are changing the way chemicals are made. Our mission is to invent cleaner, safer, energy efficient technologies that protect the planet and human health. And we've been doing this for now nearly two decades. And we do this by um, collaborations between chemists and chemical engineers. And we also partner with companies across the value chain, feedstock companies, energy companies, catalyst companies, uh, and so on. The experimental work on multi phase catalytic systems on the right is guided by complementary multi-scale modeling, process simulation, sustainability assessments on the, uh, on the left. So this is an iterative process where uh, the, uh, uh, the development of the process is continuously guide, guided by science fundamentals. And then we make available technology concepts to our uh, industry partners who then license them and then make the next move uh, to uh, uh, scale up. Uh, our mission actually addresses seven of the 17 sustainability development goals that I showed earlier, uh, pertaining to resource conservation, clean energy, protecting the planet and uh, ecological systems and human health. Now, in addition, uh, we also instill uh, uh, the, the core values uh, that are put forward by the sustainable development goals. And our education program, the way we educate our students, undergraduates and graduate students, uh, they address the remaining uh, sustainability development goals that represent the core values of society and our profession indeed. The education program provides unique training in collaborative research, industry partnerships, career building skills, diversity, inclusivity, and, and safety. So what I'm going to uh, talk about today are a few examples in the time allocated, uh, time available, a uh, few examples of paradigm shifting technologies that we are developing at the uh, uh, center. And I've uh, chosen one example using conventional feedstock, because even though we use conventional feedstock during the transition, we have to do everything possible to minimize the uh, environmental footprint. So can we retrofit conventional technologies so that they're, they emit less uh, 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 carbon, uh, also other, uh, have other, uh, minimize adverse environmental impacts. And the second example is really important for the transition. Can we make materials from renewable feedstock? Which means can we make renewable uh, materials? And the third uses Carbon dioxide itself, which is abundantly available, uh, and we heard the nice talk, uh, uh, the previous speaker, how carbon dioxide is now captured. Can we use captured carbon dioxide, sequestered carbon dioxide as feedstock in itself and convert them to chemical intermediates to promote a circular economy? So I'm going to give you examples of uh, each one of these uh, three uh, cases. The first one is the terephthalic acid uh, production. This is made uh, uh, through the so-called mid-century process where paraxylene is oxidized sequentially to terephthalic acid in pressurized acetic acid medium in the stirred tank reactor that's shown on the left. And the feed itself contains dissolved cobalt, manganese, and bromine salts. And these salts act as the homogeneous catalyst. The oxidation reaction sequence, which is shown at the top of the slide, they are very fast at the reactor operating conditions. And the paraxylene is almost completely converted and the selectivity towards the terephthalic acid is uh, 99 plus percent, right? So it's almost exclusively selective towards that. And by the way, terephthalic acid is what is used to make polyethylene terephthalate fibers 
and also the PET bottles, right? And, and there are many that are uh, being produced. And what I'm addressing is not the recycling of it, which is also something that we are addressing at the center, but the production itself, how can we minimize the environmental uh, impact? So coming back to the reaction uh, system itself, uh, uh, what is elegant about this is once the uh, terephthalic acid uh, forms, it precipitates from the solution. So it can be removed by just filtration. But then the problem with the crude product that is recovered in this manner is that it contains a few thousand parts per million of this penultimate uh, oxidation product, which is the 4-carboxybenzaldehyde. And this is a chain terminator, so it poses problems during the polymerization step to make the PET uh, uh, polymer. So what is done industrially is to take this 4-carboxybenzaldehyde and hydrogenate it back to paratoluic acid. So it's really going back. And the reason that's done is because paratoluic acid is then completely miscible in water so it purifies the uh, uh, terephthalic acid and whatever comes out of this hydrogenation reactor contains less than 25 parts per million of uh, four CBA. So from the several thousand parts per million, you are now down to less than 25 parts per million and that's considered polymer grade. The problem here is that the hydrogenation unit accounts for 50% of the uh, capital cost and about 20% of the operating cost. So it also emits a lot of CO2 because the hydrogen is again generated from methane. So if one can get rid of this process and complete the oxidation here without those remnants of 4-carboxybenzaldehyde, then you can make that polymer grade terephthalic acid in one step. In order to achieve this, what we did was to develop a spray reactor. Instead of bubbling the air through this uh, 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 liquid phase, we inverted that and we developed a spray reactor. So we sprayed the liquid phase into uh, oxygen in order to create more surface area between the liquid and oxygen in an attempt to complete the oxidation all the way to terephthalic acid in one step. Now you can view each one of these spray droplets as a micron size reactor, it's a micro reactor, probably a few tens of microns. And in these droplets, the oxygen is easily saturated. So there is no oxygen starvation. Oxygen is available for all the intermediates in that reaction sequence to go all the way to terephthalic acid. And indeed, we were able to produce polymer grade terephthalic acid in a single step using this column reactor. You can see the nozzle on the left, how we spray it's a mist. And you can, again, envision them as uh, thousands of micro reactors in parallel in which the reaction is happening. And once terephthalic acid forms, it crystallizes and essentially rains down this tower that we show on the left-hand side. And the other advantage is the reaction is so fast, you don't need much residence time at all. It's about a minute at most. And by shortening the re residence time, you also uh, eliminate undesirable side reactions such as substrate and solvent burning to carbon dioxide, and again, you mitigate those uh, emissions. So we simulated this uh, process to compare it with the conventional process. And, and basically we found that this is not only cheaper, but it's also greener. Why is it cheaper? Well, because we eliminated the hydrogenation unit, you can see that the capital costs are, uh, of the spray process developed at our center is 50% of the, uh, uh, compared to the, conventional uh, process. And I, I have put here the operating costs, and these are the everyday operating costs. It's close to about uh, 66 cents per, 67 cents per pound, and that's 56 cents per pound. Yeah, we put these decimals here because remember, we told it's billions of pounds, right? So there's a lot of zeros. And even if you make one cent or two cent profit, it's significant margin for industries that produce these commodity chemicals. So here you see that by eliminating the uh, hydro hydrogenation unit, not only are you, uh, 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 are you gaining in capital costs, but you're also gaining about 15 to 20% in the operating costs as well, uh, which is a big deal. And then in terms of the, uh, 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 in terms of um, 
the greenhouse gas emissions, you can see here, again, the elimination, there's only one third, the elimination of the hydrogenation unit and also the elimination of solvent burning brings down the greenhouse gas emissions uh, substantially. So a, a classic example here that a process that is more sustainable can also be cheaper, right? And it's, uh, if you think about it, we are being resource efficient. We are conserving feedstock, we are conserving energy, and so we are making profits for the process and at the same time, causing less of an adverse environmental footprint. So this was made available and we have had collaborations with Reliance Industries in India, which is a major producer of terephthalic acid. And we are also working with other companies in order to see if we can retrofit this technology going forward uh, amidst the increasing uh, demand. So that's the, the first example and the, uh, uh, the second example I want to talk about, in fact, it's a corollary. Uh, one of our industry partners came to us and said, well, we have this renewable feedstock with which we can make non-phthalate-based esters. Uh, polyethylene terephthalate, a phthalate-based ester, uh, is considered a neurotoxin uh, when people make toys out of that or uh, in very low levels, it's not um, a desirable uh, plastic, nor is it uh, in terms of its uh, barrier properties, excluding oxygen and so on. But this particular chemical, furan dicarboxylic acid, which can be made from, um, uh, from uh, hydroxymethyl furfural, which, uh, which again is made from fructose by dehydrating fructose that you get from corn, um, uh, provides the potential for making a renewable uh, polyester, which is much better uh, than uh, PET. And so this lists all the desirable uh, properties of uh, polyethylene furanate compared to polyethylene terephthalate that we currently use. And Javin, Dr. Javin Zhou, my, one of my postdocs, worked on this project. And the idea was, uh, can we use the spray process to make this product? We, we uh, just I showed you how the spray process is more sustainable, greener, and indeed the answer is yes, we were able to convert this raw material, renewable feedstock, into this renewable uh, precursor for making polyester uh, in pretty uh, uh, appreciable amount, and we get this polymer-grade product in one step. Of course, this is at a lab scale, and, and uh, this uh, particular technology is now uh, uh, being developed by ADM and DuPont jointly developing the PEF uh, technology. So the second example uh, is lignin. You know, we are using a, a, a renewable uh, feedstock and lignin is a, a byproduct of um, the uh, uh, cellulosic ethanol plants. Uh, ethanol is uh, one of the uh, uh, touted as one of the renewable fuels and when you look at lignocellulosic, most of the cellulose and the hemicellulose go to form the ethanol and other uh, uh, chemical products, leaving behind uh, lignin. Lignin is currently just burned as fuel, very little value, but yet that's the only source of aromatics that we know of in nature, uh, the uh, aromatic compounds. So if we are able to recover those aromatic, we can add value to this biorefinery, and that would provide a source of internal subsidy rather than external government subsidy to keep these types of uh, 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 afloat, the, the industries afloat. So how do we leverage Ligman's chemistry? And if you look at the nice work of uh, uh, Professor uh, Ralph at University of Wisconsin, uh, they have done detailed characterization work of Ligman, and I show here the lignin from say switch grasses, derived from switch grasses, they tend to have a lot of linkages, ether bonds, carbon-carbon double bonds that keep these uh, biopolymer together, right? And you can see all these uh, aromatic rings, these phenolic compounds. So the approach that we took is, can we sequentially deconstruct this lignin by attacking these bonds, uh, understanding the chemistry and going after these bonds? So um, uh, our first thought was when we have this carbon-carbon double bond, 
these are uh, sus uh, susceptible to uh, ozonolysis, ozone attack. In other words, ozone can quickly sever this bond and they should, we should be able to separate out these types of aromatic, aromatic aldehydes, for example. And then once we separate it out, then we can uh, sequentially attack then the ether bonds and thereby deconstruct it. Fortunately, the ozonolysis reaction is so fast that we expose a solution of this lignin in ozone. And, and then we, once we are able to separate out these types of aromatic aldehydes, then sequentially we can go after the ether bonds. And that was the idea. And we put that um, to use, again, using a spray process. Spray process works where the reactions are very fast, like oxidation reactions. And so here we used a, a spray process where the lignin solution was sprayed as droplets into ozone. And so the ozone saturates each one of these micro reactors uh, because of the high gas liquid interfacial area. And these are calculations that show uh, uh, facile permeation of the ozone into 35 micron droplets. There are very, very small droplets and they can do that in a fraction of a second. And then we also show that we can perform these ozonolysis safely, but just at ambient pressure and temperature, right? And then the vapor phase we ensure is outside the uh, flammability uh, region. If you want more details, you can refer to this publication, but in the interest of time, I just want to point out the salient features of uh, our process. So uh, Andrew and Julian are the ones who put together this continuous spray reactor. So essentially we spray uh, the uh, ozone uh, here like a fountain, and then we, uh, into, uh, we, we spray the acetic acid solution, I should say, the lignin solution. And then we collect that liquid and then analyze them. And what we find is indeed that we find these types of uh, uh, aldehydes. Uh, this is uh, vanillin, this is 4-carboxy, uh, 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 hydroxybenzaldehyde, I should say, 4-hydroxybenzaldehyde. And of course, uh, these natural vanilla have tremendous value and they can also be easily separated because uh, they're small molecular weight and then you have a large molecular weight uh, lignin backbone. And so by membrane filtration, for example, we were able to separate these out very easily and this carries tremendous value. So when you talk about subsidizing, these are the kind of uh, product values that you should be producing, diversifying the products in order to make profitable uh, biorefineries. And just to show that the ozonolysis actually leaves um, uh, pretty much the lignin backbone intact, uh, we do uh, a gel permeation chromatography. Uh, this is the molecular weight distribution on the x-axis, uh, which goes to uh, uh, thousands of, uh, hundreds of thousands of Daltons. Uh, the uh, unreacted lignin is shown in, uh, uh, in green and then the ozonized lignin in red. And you can see that uh, except at the low molecular weight end where it cleaves off those aromatic aldehydes, the rest of the structure is really well preserved. And, uh, uh, and one of the things we show here is we can extract out the, the ozonized lignin. We can even extract out or bifurcate it into a low molecular weight fraction and a high molecular weight fraction. And we show that indeed the low molecular weight fraction does have um, the smaller fragments of the uh, lignin while leaving the high molecular weight fraction intact. And this uh, frame uh, shows the, uh, 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 the lignin before ozonolysis, after ozonolysis at various magnifications. Uh, these are scanning electron micrographs. And, and you can see that there are subtle changes, but largely the structure is preserved. And we have also done uh, NMR analysis where uh, we show that uh, in the uh, solids that are remaining, the ether bonds, which is uh, uh, the, uh, as I showed you in a previous slide, that links those biopolymers together, that is preserved. So well, one of the ideas we had was here we have in our solution, uh, these, uh, uh, the lignin ba uh, backbone, and then we also have phenolic compounds and we looked at the conventional way of making these bakelite resins. So you take phenol, you take formaldehyde, you mix them together under acidic conditions, they form <clears throat> these novelac type resins. <clears throat> so the question that we had was, here we have in our ozonized uh, solution, after we uh, 
uh, ozonize it, we have these types of aromatic aldehydes with the, uh, the uh, uh, hydroxyl group. Can we then take that, acidify just that ozonized uh, solution so we can graft these onto the lignin backbone? And the answer is yes, this LPP is lignin-based pre-polymers. So we were able to, to form lignin-based resins. These are, again, very similar to Novolac resins, except these are petroleum-derived feedstock, and these are completely renewable feedstocks, and we were able to demonstrate this. And now we are in the process of scaling up uh, this uh, technology. Uh, other uh, evidence of uh, taking the lignin, subjecting it to ozonolysis, and then acidifying it to get the lignin resin, this is the so-called uh, thermogravimetric analysis. And you can see that uh, the, uh, the resin, the red curve, resists combustion uh, more uh, than the, uh, uh, either the ozonized lignin or the received lignin. This is a clear indication that when we acidify, we are forming strong carbon-carbon bonds which resist combustion. And that's what you want in a building material. And again, when you look at uh, the, uh, uh, the lignin resin compared to the ash received lignin, the ozonized lignin, you can clearly see at various magnifications that uh, the structure is now changed and we get a smoother structure. These are resins. So what we have done is really taken the lignin and we have reconstructed it to form this renewable building material. Um, uh, I'm just going to also show you, you, we could have taken that ozonized li lignin mixture and then we went after the, uh, uh, the ether linkages. Uh, this is Kakasad Nandiwale who showed that we can indeed uh, sever or break now the um, ether linkage sequentially uh, uh, and, and it can be done continuously. So this is a, in a continuous reactor, continuous production. Uh, again, these form low molecular weight uh, uh, compounds uh, just to show you that we can, the other pathway is to break the uh, ether linkages if you want to have more uh, aromatic uh, uh, monomers. Uh, and this was done catalytically uh, uh, we use a, a zirconium-based uh, mesoporous silicate. It's a solid Lewis acid, uh, and it uh, has the, uh, uh, the, uh, the tendency to selectively break those uh, ether bonds. So I want to show you the lignocellulosic biorefinery, uh, where you take the lignin, we dissolve it in acetone, break the carbon-carbon double bonds by ozonolysis, we can break the CO bonds catalytically, as I showed you, and then we can synthesize, build the carbon-carbon double bonds, and we are able to use more than 95% of the, uh, uh, the lignin to form this product. And we are able to also recycle the, uh, 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 recycle the uh, solvent. So we can, uh, once we form the solid, we can filter, filter it and recycle. So this is, um, uh, a sustainable uh, process because we are using a uh, sustainable feedstock uh, and we are also doing the solvent uh, uh, recycling. So the last uh, uh, example is the opportunities and challenges in CO2 conversion. Um, it, in the last decade, uh, uh, several researchers in several labs have shown that uh, electrocatalytically uh, making use of uh, uh, of uh, either uh, uh, electrons generated or, or photoelectrocatalytically, one can reduce the carbon dioxide to make CO. And of course, once you have carbon monoxide, it can be activated more easily with hydrogen to make methanol, for example. So from a renewable feedstock or an abundantly available feedstock, such as sequestered CO2, you can go to valuable or useful chemicals. What are the challenges? Well, we know that um, uh, 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 that uh, CO2 is highly recalcitrant. It's uh, kinetic and thermodynamic stability makes it very difficult to convert it. It's in the total oxidized state. And then of course, uh, uh, in, when you perform this electrocatalysis uh, uh, um, uh, using electrolytes in aqueous media, the overall reduction rate is limited by the uh, low solubility of CO2 uh, in the aqueous medium, in the water-based medium. So how do we then increase the solubility of CO2 in the uh, liquid phase containing the electrolyte? Because that's really the key 
rate limiting step. So the idea that we came up with was to use um, the so-called carbon dioxide uh, expanded electrolytes, or uh, the, the way we like to call it is putting the fizz in electrochemistry. Um, what we do here is we dissolve the electrolyte in an organic solvent and, uh, um, and essentially pump pressurized carbon dioxide into it. And carbon dioxide is soluble in this. What is shown here is the so-called volume expansion versus carbon dioxide pressure when you take this organic solvent in which this electrolyte is dissolved. So you can see that the volume increases like almost 300%. And the, and, and the reason this does so is because carbon dioxide, when it's pressurized, becomes a liquid at ambient temperatures and it dissolves in this organic uh, solvents. We call it expanded liquids because if you release the pressure, the CO2 goes away. Um, so we are now able to operate under these conditions where the carbon dioxide concentration in the liquid phase is orders of magnitude greater than in water. So these are the types of specialized reactors we created. And I want to acknowledge my uh, coworkers, uh, Professor uh, Blakemore in the Department of Chemistry and Professor Leonard, the Department of uh, Chemical and Petroleum Engineering. And we demonstrated the first electrocatalytic uh, reaction in uh, CO2 expanded uh, electrolytes very recently. Uh, it was featured in Kemsa Schem uh, journal. And in this medium, we were able to get reliable cyclic uh, voltammetry of the soluble uh, electrolyte species. And more importantly, we were able to intensify or accelerate CO production on the, uh, uh, on, on, on the gold and copper electrodes. And as shown here, as you increase the CO2 pressure, you can see that the rate increases uh, quite dramatically. But then at higher CO2 pressures, it decreases because CO2 being nonpolar does not, is not as conductive. The medium is not conductive. So there is an optimum pressure where you maximize the current density. And this current density is roughly around uh, 175 milliamps. And just to give you a benchmark, the Department of Energy considers 200 milliamps per uh, centimeter squared of electrode area as kind of the target to make this practically viable. And we are already there in an unoptimized system, just using existing catalysts. And now we are working to create catalysts in which this power can be fully unleashed because of the, uh, uh, the high dissolution of the uh, CO2 in the liquid medium. And uh, most recently, we uh, not only in heterogeneous catalysts, we can also uh, enhance the rates of molecular electrocatalysis. This is also an important result where we are able to show that in rhenium-based complexes, which we can achieve the same reduction at high Faradayic efficiency. Um, and here you see a five-fold increase in the, uh, 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 the electrocatalytic reduction rate as you increase uh, the CO2 pressure. So I want to stop here uh, just to show you that we do have the ability to develop the chemistries to convert these renewable feedstocks. <laughs> I want to acknowledge um, uh, the many funding agencies over the years that have funded our work, uh, the National Science Foundation, the United States Department of uh, uh, Agriculture, the Department of Energy, Environmental Protection Agency, and our industry partners across the value chain uh, who are all committed to uh, sustainable development. And this is our group. Again, this is pre-pandemic. Uh, I want to assure you, we practice uh, uh, social distancing and CDC guidelines very much at the University of Kansas. Um, and I want to leave you uh, today uh, with a couple of quotes from renowned naturalists. Uh, the first, uh, Sir David uh, Attenborough, uh, and, the, and, uh, and then um, uh, Dr. Anil Prakash Joshi. Uh, they have been witnessing firsthand the perils of climate change on our ecosystem. Uh, from the Arctic to the Himalayan region. Uh, their message, which is quoted here, is actually echoed by the United Nations Sustainability Development Goals, that industrialization must be transformed uh, to protect the ecosystem. Uh, and I would say that chemical engineers have a noble calling and critical role in de delivering uh, sustainable solutions. 
Uh, let me close by thanking the organizers again for this opportunity to present this lecture and wishing you all a very uh, uh, happy new year in which hopefully the pandemic is flattened and the world returns to normal. Uh, I will turn it back now to the uh, uh, session chair at this time. So thank you very much, sir. Uh, now I'm requesting our professor, council member, Professor M.K. Jha, to put both of thanks and summarize this memorial lecture session. Please, sir. I, on behalf of organizing committee, and on my personal behalf, convey our sincere thanks to all the my personal behalf. Convey our sincere thanks. Sir, sir, can you unmute? Yes. Sir. Convey our sincere thanks to all the distinguished speakers of Memorial Lecture, lecture. such as Professor Bala Surmaniam, University of Kansas, for Dr. H.L. Rai Memorial Lecture, Dr. R. R. Sonbate, Vice President, Harmex, for Professor N. R. Kamath for Memorial professor Lecture, N. R. Kamath and Professor Devansu Bhattacharya from West Virginia University for Inventor Senior Memorial Lecture. The lectures were very, very important, in, informative, and we got a lot of beautiful information. information. Thank you, sir, Thank for you. accepting our invitation to be part of Chemcon 2020, 2020 in spite of your busy schedule and this pandemic situation. Sir. We seek your we continuous, seek support continuous support in our future endeavor also. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. And uh, thank you. I hope thank you all very this, much. Uh, we uh, end today's uh, Chemcon day one. We end of the today's uh, technical session. We have completed. I once again thank you all the uh, le the award le uh, awardees lecturers for today's nice lectures and make this award uh, lecture memorial lecture ceremony also uh, a grand success. So thank you, sir, once again for your uh, inconvenience time you uh, present and you deliver the lectures. So it is really great to us. So thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. And uh, tomorrow you very much. we will start our parallel technical session from 9 o'clock. So I think respected chairpersons and students can uh, uh, over the charge uh, from 9 o'clock. Then uh, from 10 o'clock, uh, there will be a, uh, uh, we, we had a, Panel discussion and parallelly we had rescheduled our Dhirubhai Ammani commemoration day celebration inaugural. inaugural. Earlier it was planned from 12:30, so due to certain uh, inconvenience from the chief guest, so it has been preponed from 10:45. The Dhirubhai Ammani memorial lectures also will be start parallelly apart from the panel discussion. So all the delegates so all the, and uh, the person are requested to follow the messages and links what would be given in the whatsapp groups and as well as in our iicg headquarter website so all the meetings links are available whatever we are changing that is also updating so thank you very much we hope that uh, tomorrow again we'll meet so have a nice day thank you very much so we are ending today's uh, program and chemcon 2020 fast day yeah. thank you professor bala bye bye yes yeah, thank you thank you, thank you sir yeah bye bye Bala, thank you. Very thank nice lecture. You. Oh, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Karthi, yeah. 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 Please inform all the members of the <coughs> council meeting time. Uh, council meeting, I think uh, 5 5.30. 5.30 we will start. Yeah, now we have we have 5 to 10. So ah. after 10 minutes, we can take a break and meet. Yes, yes. So that, that link is different through go to meeting. 